itself. Yeah, Keith, your name is Anita Caseman. You need to change that. Okay, so the room is We're now open. I just out. want to give it a minute for everybody to trickle in. If you click, if you bring your mouse over to your picture, Keith, and you hit, there's three little dots at the top right. Right click uh -huh. on your face image. Right click on your face image. Don't click on it. Right click on it. Oh, I'm on my phone too. So. Oh, oh Joe, can you change his name? Or make me an admin. I'll do it. <laughs> classic, classic. Yeah. John, you you know you got the whole community talking about you on the treadmill. You're like the running joke. Good. They, what they need to do is <laughs> they need to start a pool on guessing how many steps I do. Oh, that's a nice one. And the donation goes to uh, you know the food bank or something. I like it keep things other, interesting the other day i hit oh yeah for the joint the upper bucks that night monday yeah i hit over fifty thousand steps what that's insane how do you do it and should i tell you that it's barefoot too no way way really that's not you uncomfortable to, you have to build up your tolerance but it's yeah. actually it's you know it's, it's better for your arches is that oh. like like there's even people that do barefoot running because it's it, you know you have stronger stronger feet yeah instead of being weakened so by... being from the south does have advantages <laughs> we like to be barefoot you know just a yeah. joke but... <laughs> I, I won't yeah i'm not touching that one <laughs> you know better <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't work so well if it's icy cold out <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to give some time. Um, people are still trickling in here. Keith is Keith now. Okay. Keith, you at the hospital? Oh, Brian, you're back. You're good. No, I just got in. I'm, uh, I'm just grabbing a little quick bite because I thought this thing started at 7, so I reread my uh, email, so. Not only do we have a meeting, but it started early. Thank you, Kaylin. You know what? You you just hush. You're welcome, by the way. Great. Okay, Jenny's trying to get in, so let me. Dr. Damsker, I thought I saw the cases dropped today for the first time in a little bit. Um, yeah, every day, every day goes up and down a little bit because uh, Quest is sort of the bear right now because they dump cases on random days because you know, they're, they're still behind. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see anywhere, we could see anywhere between 21 and 60 cases a day, depending on how they come in. That's why uh, the most important thing to look at is onset date, not the case report date. That's why it's very, the case report date means nothing. The onset date of the case is what we look at. But the state likes to, the state likes to report case report date because that's all they have. But when you're actually doing the work, um, you, can, you can get the onset date out of people and that's what you look at. Because sometimes we get a case where their onset date was, you know, July 1st and we don't get the report until today. So, you know, it doesn't mean that there's any problem from a month ago. So it's, it's a whole, um, it, it, the, the case report date is totally different than the case onset date. That's what we look at here is the onset date. Yeah, I was I was tracking the CDC weekly report data uh, for each week, and the July, I think like the July fourth between the, that and the July eleventh, mysteriously twenty two hundred cases appeared ten weeks earlier in April. You know, so you still saw this weird balloon suddenly on on one week's report, and then the next week's report, that that blob of Kind of like they filled in the curve and that blob moved to the the end of the month and it's like i think the problem is nobody ever looked at this data this closely before and it's you know right. there's all kinds of integration issues getting you know garbage in garbage out and yeah it's pretty rough to 
I mean, I was notified today that one of the nursing homes, I won't say which, you know, they, there was about 20 some cases they never reported to us back from April. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to, re so when we get those cases, we're going to have to report those as, a, as cases, whatever day we get them, whether it's tomorrow or the next day. And they're from April, it's nothing to do with today. And it's, uh, but it's going to bump up our case number for that day. Well, yeah, right. that, and that's the, that's the flaw, right? Is, is you, you get this, these, these, it's actually only 300 new cases, but it looks like 3,000. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah, Jenny so. is about to join us, guys. Um, thank you all for your patience. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, give her maybe just a quick second. And then. I go off video every once in a while, I'll take a bite of bratwurst. So, in case you wonder. We're, we're going to be paying close attention. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order and knowing that Jenny should be joining us briefly. So we'll start with the flag salute and Joe, you want to get us a flag going here? Okay, I pledge allegiance mm -hmm. to, the flag. to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic for, which for which it stands. stands. One, One nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. All right, Anita, would you like to take the roll call, please? Mr. Jackson. I'm here. Mr. Kern. Here. Mr. Akmanowitz. Ms. Weed. Mr. Micucci. I'm here. Mr. Reimers. Say something, Mr. Reimers. He might be muted. I saw yeah. him. He's here. Yeah. Um, Mr. Spear. Here. All right. Uh, the only announcement I have is that this meeting is being recorded by the board secretary. So thank you all uh, for joining us at this special meeting tonight. Tonight we feature Dr. Damsker. He's the director of the Bucks County Health Department. And afterwards, we're going to update you on some great work, some of the great work that Lifespan has been doing during the spring and summer and the plans to support our district, uh, their plans to support our district before and after care. Uh, and we have a couple of items that are on the agenda, but other than that, it's a pretty light agenda. So on Monday, we hosted a tour for Dr. Damsker of the high school in Quakertown Elementary. In attendance were myself, Dr. Harner. Uh, Rob, I, I think I'm always gonna butcher your name. It's Chris Stein, is that correct? The correct, correct way to say that? Thumbs up? Thumbs yes, down. that's fine. Oh, he said that's fine, okay. Um, and the principals from each school, Chris Spear was in attendance as well as Dave from the board. And Joe from QE was a really great help. He walked the halls and observed some common areas that students will be moving um, within. We also spent a good amount of time in a few classrooms that were pre-staged at three feet, four and a half feet, five feet, as well as six feet of separation. We toured the science lab in the high school and the gym and in QE as well. During our time in the classrooms, we corrected some of the initial spacing to refle reflect the proper distance, uh, then tested some of the configurations. We determined that three feet of separation will not be needed to accommodate our students in the classroom. It felt really tight. We really weren't comfortable with that. The distances of four and a half, five, and even six feet should work depending on our enrollment demand. In fact, I, I feel pretty good about saying I think we can get pretty close to that, but of course we're going to have to wait for those enrollment numbers to come back. The way that we were distancing it prior to when we went to the schools was six feet from desk to desk, and instead we did it six feet from person to person. That does make a pretty significant difference. Dr. Damsker oversaw and assisted us in the reconfigurations and felt comfortable recommending those configurations for us to bring our students and staff back into the buildings. I'm sure he'll speak to that. We'd like to thank everyone from Dr. Damsker, Dr. Harner, the entire facility staff, and the building administrators for helping us stage these rooms for us and showing us how the real world spacing options will look. And we'll show you some pictures that we took 
later on in the meeting. Uh, I do want to set the stage a little bit. We normally have public comment occur in the beginning of the meeting and we're actually going to, we're going to keep public comment to the end of the meeting this time. But, but rest assured, I did go through every single question that we had in our public comments and I did incorporate that into the questions that we're going to be asking Dr. Damsker. We have a limited amount of time with him. We really appreciate the time that he's dedicating to us considering I know he's working really hard right now, especially right now. So I've compiled that list of questions. I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. If we do have some time, I want to open it up to the other board members, although I've compiled their questions as well. I've compiled questions from public comment, from our teachers union, from the community, and from board members. So we do have quite a few to go through. Um, so I'm going to do my best to facilitate this discussion. If we have time, like I said afterwards, we'll try to briefly let board members ask direct questions. So with that, welcome Dr. Damsker. Thanks for being with us tonight. Why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself, your medical background, what your focus has been as the health director with Bucks County, as well as your qualifications in regards to infectious diseases. And, and let us know, have you handled infectious diseases uh, outbreaks in the past? Yeah, thank you, Kaylin. I appreciate it. Um, I've been doing uh, public health for about 20 years. Uh, I did a residency in public health and general preventive medicine at, down at uh, Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, I went to medical school at Hahnemann, yeah, exactly, which is now, I guess, Drexel University a School of Medicine. Um, I received my Master's of Public Health at Tulane as well. Um, and I've been doing public health for about 20 years. And I've been involved with things all the way back from the um, uh, from mosquito-borne outbreaks that they've had in Louisiana um, in, in the early 2000s. Uh, we had the first SARS outbreak. Uh, I led the charge here with H1N1. Uh, here in Bucks County, we gave tens of thousands of doses in every school district. Uh, we, on a regular basis, we handle measles, mumps, pertussis, um, chicken pox, and about 30 other diseases people haven't even heard of. Um, there's, there's 70 reportable diseases here in Bucks County uh, or in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, of course, recently we were handling the Ebola crisis. Uh, my department was much more involved with Ebola than people realized. There was people coming from countries in Africa that we had to monitor daily uh, for many, many months. Uh, people didn't realize how long the response was lasting. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a big part of my job is dealing with infectious disease outbreaks here in Bucks County on a regular basis. Um, and of course, this, this, the, uh, the coronavirus 19 outbreak uh, is clearly uh, the most, in a lot of ways, the most difficult and challenging one we've had um, because it is obviously a relatively uh, a new strain of, a, of a, we deal with coronaviruses all the time, uh, but this is a different kind of coronavirus uh, with regard to what it can do to people. And, and, and it's, it's sort of a worst case virus in a lot of ways because it's, um, it can go all the way from no symptoms all the way to putting someone on a ventilator. So it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting yet uh, difficult disease to deal with. So um, that's just, I guess, the kind of way I do want to get into sort of what's happening here in Bucks County, or let me know what you want to talk about because it's there's yeah. so much that we can go oh, into. Yeah. We have a lot. We have a lot. Um, so before we get into the questions, I know that you have children yourself and some people wanted to know do you feel safe sending your kids to school and are you opting for your children to return back to school uh yes um i i have three daughters uh in the central buck school district um uh, they they their model is uh, for the element for the elementary education uh, i'm going to ask my youngest to go back to school full time and at the secondary level they have a hybrid model which i would be um placing my older two daughters in, in that model. Um, I do understand that there's, you know, that there's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, um, you know, fear in people and I get that, um, you know, and I, but I do believe that uh, the districts are all offering either, whether it's in-person or hybrid, there's an in-person type model and there's also a virtual model. And I think by offering both of those types of things that allows any family to make the decision that's best for their family. Yes, thank you, thank you. So, as you mentioned, we do have a lot of anxiety with families, with teachers, staff, about returning to a school environment. So, yes, can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned about this virus, how it's transmitted, um, how is it specifically affecting our local community, and do you feel like it's controlled in our local community? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely, like, it, it, it's it spread similarly to the flu virus, which is a droplet spread. Um, this is when someone is coughing, sneezing, 
um, you know, and, and someone is, is close by to them. And those droplets get on your hands, get in your eyes, nose, or mouth. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes it gets in your hands, you rub, you rub your eye, you might, you know, eat something, uh, you might touch something. You know, the, the, the CDC has kind of gone back and forth a little bit on whether you can touch a table and get it. Um, and um, we believe that you can get it from touching surfaces. Uh, the virus can last. Uh, I'm, we're not sure whether that's the majority of the way people are getting it, but uh, we've had, we had one case where someone didn't touch anything but a gas pump. Um, and the person literally didn't go anywhere, didn't do anything, didn't talk to anybody, but touched a gas pump. Um, so it clearly can be spread on, on surfaces. We don't know just how far, but that's why, you know, cleaning surfaces is obviously a major part of, of our response. Um, what I can tell you here in Bucks County is that we had overall, we had a large spike, you know, mid to late April through early May. Um, many of those cases, unfortunately, were in our long-term care facilities where we had um, some deaths. We had a lot of deaths in those facilities. And this disease clearly um, has a major impact on those that are, uh, that are, those that are especially bedridden, those that are long-term care facilities, these are our most fragile citizens. Um, and, and, and it made it into those facilities, um, many, time, many of which uh, you know, happened because you know, employees back in the early days, uh, they might say, oh, I don't have a fever, I must not have coronavirus, and they go into work. And, and we know that the employees did bring it into some of those facilities. Um, but we, we came down, you know, obviously we were in the red zone for a long time, as everyone on this call is very aware. And, um, you know, over time, the cases, we went up high, we came back down. Uh, and, and I was saying this from the very beginning, that once we moved into the yellow and then again the green, um, you know, we're opening all businesses, right? Almost every business is open um, that, that can be open, even if they're in a, in a controlled or, or restricted fashion. And, you know, everyone's out and about. So, you know, the, the idea that we have a few more cases than we did at the very bottom uh, makes a lot more sense. So if we have an average of 40 cases a day today versus 20, you know, cases a day at our lowest, uh, we feel like we're sort of at a plateau now where we have this, um, there, there's a baseline number of cases here in Bucks County. We'll probably be there uh, for a while until a vaccine comes out or something else happens to change that. What I can tell you is in the, uh, the municipalities that make up Quaker Town School District, Right now, we have 27 active cases in those five municipalities, uh, with Milford, Hancock, Quakertown Borough, Richland Township, and uh, or maybe there's six, Trump Bowersville and um, uh, Richland Town. But I believe there's, there's 27 active cases right now in the entire school district. Now, of course, there's more than that, most likely, because not everybody gets tested, um, right. you know, and, and not everybody you know, feels the need, because some people, a lot of people don't have major symptoms, or they know that their wife had it, and they know they probably have it, so they don't want to go get swabbed, which is not a pleasant experience, depending on where you go. Um, but overall, I would say the upper part of the county um, has the least number of cases, you know, as opposed to the middle or the lower part of the county. And that is obviously in, in Quaker Town's favor. Um, the, the population density is a little bit lower in the upper end of the county than it is, and there's portions that are crowded, but certainly relative to the lower end of the county, it's less crowded. And I think that um, everyone, you know, walking around, people are wearing masks, people are doing the things they need to do. Uh, and, and overall, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're sort of at a plateau. It's a higher plateau than we were when everyone was in their houses, um, where everybody is sort of, and yeah, there, there's a good graph. I'm going to go um, ahead and share this data with yeah. Uh, that. Yeah, hold on one second. Let me. And, and that graph, that graph is done by onset date. I want to explain to everybody on this call the difference between onset date versus the case report date. The case report date, like, so let's say today, we had 50 cases today at the health department. Some of those cases were old. Some of those cases may have had an onset date in June, in July, but we were just made aware of them today. So we have to report them to the state and publicly today. But the onset date of that case, the, the first day that person felt symptoms, uh, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're, that's the most important part of an epi curve. An epidemiology curve shows the onset date. It's like, it's like, you know, if you go to a wedding or you hear about the stories, oh, there's a bunch of people with diarrhea or vomiting from a wedding. You, you don't look at what day the case is reported because that could be a week or two later. You look at what day the onset. So you, you look, okay, after a wedding, one day, 12 people got sick. Two days later, four people got sick. You don't say, well, the cases were all reported two weeks later. So that's when they all got sick, right? You look at the actual onset of those, of the symptoms. So this graph shows how we had a large spike, uh, and you can see that the, the, the individual um, columns are the actual numbers of cases we reported that day, but that, the, the line that you show is sort of the overall trend line that you can do on Excel. And it shows we had a major spike uh, you know, earlier in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the pandemic. We came down, uh, and then slowly we became, came up, once we went to yellow and green, 
uh, and people were out and about a little bit more, you can see why um, you know, those cases went up. But I think everybody understands that common sense says that the more people that are out and about, the more likely to get cases. And the, the bottom part of this graph, you can see the number of deaths. And you know, the vast majority of those deaths, as I said earlier, were in our nursing care facilities or long-term care facilities. And you can see since we've gotten that problem under control, and they're doing things like, you know, everyone is being tested in these facilities like every week. You know, all the staff members are being tested, all the residents. So we've been able to keep it out of our, out of our long-term care facilities uh, for the most part since that outbreak. And you can see the deaths obviously are way down. And that's what happens. Once you get, once you get this virus into the non-long-term care population, the death rate goes way, way, way down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's been no deaths in Bucks County of anyone under 30. Uh, and the few people that have been younger, you know, they've had some of them has very severe underlying conditions. It doesn't negate how tra tragic it is, obviously, but it does show that um, that for the most part, uh, you know, it certainly is not affecting the children in schools. Uh, and I understand, you know, the, and we can get into that later about you know how that could affect other people. But clearly, um, children, uh, you know, have a much better uh, outcome from this disease, and that's been shown, uh, you know, time and time again. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next one. Why won't it let me go? By the way, while Kalen's doing that, Dr. Damsker, if go. I might, when you mention uh, cases being like, like tests happening multiple times in the nursing homes, th does that cause double, triple? Like, does that add a data point for a positive each time? No, no, no. Um, if, if someone is tested, you know, on January or July 1st, they're positive. They're tested again on July 8th and still positive. They only count once for our numbers. Okay. Good. All right, here's the next slide. Right. And this is community spread. So we, we define the definition of community spread is when we have no idea when the person got sick. So we, we do contact tracing on every case in Bucks County. We try to figure out you know, where they've been, who they've been in contact with. We try to figure out where they got it from. That's, and then obviously talk to any close contacts and, and let them know um, that they need to either quarantine or get tested or whatever the situation may be. And you can see here, we started off with, with, and again, the community spread in general did go up, but the number, the overall numbers aren't that high. Um, because we can, it's, it's actually, when you take the time to call people and figure out where they got it from, a lot of times they can say, you know, I ended up, uh, I was in a car with someone who told me they tested positive, so we know, we know how they, they, they got sick. And when we can keep that under control uh, in as little number as possible, it doesn't mean that there's not spread in the community. But pure community spread is defined as not knowing. And, and it took a while uh, for that to, to bump up. The first few weeks of this, of this outbreak, we were able to basically pinpoint, all right, this person came back from Spain, or this person came from China, or this person you know, hung out with someone who came from Spain. And then we slowly worked our way up to saying, the person said, I didn't go anywhere that I know of. All I went to do, I went to the grocery store. And that's, we still consider those to be pure community spread, where they don't know anyone who is sick, they haven't been around anybody, you know, at work. Sometimes we have work outbreaks where, you know, multiple people at an office get sick and they know they work somewhere. They're told, okay, you know, Bob, Fred, and Joe all had a disease in, in that shop where I work. And so we know where they got it from. Now, again, it doesn't mean they're not cases. They all count as cases. But when those numbers start to go up, where we can't figure out where they got it, that's how we know the virus is, sort of, is circulating in the, in the community more. Um, and that it's not just people that know where they got it. So that's the, sort of the definition of pure community spread. And you can see that we had a little bump um, after 4th of July, and, and there's no question in my mind, and we've done the contact tracing, the case investigations, that once the summer hit, once people were out in the bad and green, uh, we've had a lot of cases of people going to the Jersey Shore. We've had a lot of cases of people going to 4th of July parties. Uh, and that, that's a real thing. And you know, I, I wish I could tell people, go into someone's house just because you know them, uh, you know where you're going. It doesn't mean that COVID, COVID doesn't know whether your friends or not. And I think it's really important to remember uh, that that you go into someone's house when there's alcohol involved or whatever the situation is. You know, still try to maintain your social distance. Uh, if you're outside, keep that six feet distance because we've seen people saying, "Well, I'm going to my friend Bob's house, you know, for a big party. I can't get COVID there because I know Bob, right?" And and it's interesting that those those things have actually caused more problems in a lot of ways than you know, people randomly getting it at Target. You know, we just don't, it, it's, it's actually more from people you know, thinking that they're in a comfortable situation uh, and that's where they end up getting it sometimes. So we want people to focus on those kinds of places. You can still hang out with your friends and, and do things, but be smart when you do it. Um, and then the, uh, I think there was, you said you wanted me to look at this one more graph and this is the final graph. And it just kind of, it just kind of captures everything I said earlier about you know, the, the deaths being in the older population. 
you can see all the way on the right, you know, that the, the people that are 90 years and older, they only account for, you know, six or 7%, whatever that number is, but they were 30 plus percent of the deaths. And that the 80 to 89 people were, you know, more than a third of the deaths in Bucks County, but they were only 10% of the cases. Um, and as you get younger, the cases, the deaths and the hospitalizations go way down relative to the number of cases that they have. Uh, and we've seen that. And this is another thing I want to go is it's really, really important. And we'll get into this, I'm sure, later too. The numbers of hospitalizations that we have right now, about 20. And that's the same number we had way back, even before we closed school in mid-March. We're doing really, really well with hospitalizations. So even though we've had this spike in cases, our hospitalization numbers have, have remained the same or low. I speak to our hospitals every single week, uh, and not one hospital um, is, is stressed about COVID. And I mean stressed as in the numbers of COVID they have. We have several hospitals that have either zero or one COVID patient in their entire hospital. Um, 20 in the whole county, you're saying? Correct. 20, co and that's actually it's even less because 20, pay 20 Bucks County residents are in the hospital right now. That includes even hospitals outside of Bucks County. So there's even less than 20 patients that are hospitalized in Bucks County right now. Uh, but there are a few residents that, you know, they could be a Temple or Abington or places that are outside of the county. So our hospitals are not feeling the strain from COVID right now. Some of the hospitals, obviously, they're getting a little bit busier with normal stuff. You know, people are finally getting out and about. They feel comfortable leaving their homes and getting things done. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that I want to mention that, uh, you know, that they, the hospitals, a lot of them are doing pre-surgery testing and pre-operation testing and things. And we're not seeing a ton of people turning positive on this. You know, we've seen it's about 1%. Mm -hmm. um, so that shows you that there's not a ton of virus just circulating in random people everywhere. Uh, we do know that there's more cases than what we have confirmed. We're about 1%. You know, we're over 1% of our county has now gotten COVID. And, and um, so, you know, that's about 6,280 because there's 628,000 people in the county. But um, what that tells you is that, uh, you know, they're doing pre-exposure, pre pre-surgery and pre-procedure uh, testing, and they're not getting a lot of positives, which is another good sign. Mm -hmm. So overall, again, the hospitalizations are low, and I can't emphasize that enough. That was why Governor Wolf you know, did the stay at home order at the beginning, right? They didn't want the hospitals to be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And right now, knock on wood, uh, I totally don't want to jinx anything. Um, but even with our even with our bump up to the average of, you know, 40 or so cases a day, our hospitals are not being stressed at all. And some of them don't have any COVID patients in them. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many patients have we had uh, who are children throughout this time that have been hospitalized? I believe there's been, there was one or two. Uh, and uh, one of them was a newborn who was put in there after they, they, they were a little, they were, they were, they were infected by their mother, uh, and they were just being careful and they kept the baby in the hospital for a day. Uh, mm -hmm. and there was one other person that was in the hospital, um, uh, and they were, I believe they're in there for one night. Um, okay. so we really have, we have had, uh, no serious illnesses in children so far. And we've been lucky, uh, clearly they, children can be seriously ill in, in, in rare situations. And you've seen that if you look across the country. Um, but here in Bucks County, we haven't seen that. Okay, great. That's good to know. It's a little, it's definitely promising. I mean, we feel it, it's so unfortunate for anyone who has to be in that scenario, but it's good to hear that that's not a huge issue, at least right now in our county. So let's talk social distancing. This is a big question that came up. So there's a lot of confusion because the target is always moving. So um, a few questions in regards to this. So what do schools do when you can't distance six feet? Should masks be weared, worn, excuse me, when um, you're able to distance six feet? And let us know your thoughts on how schools should proceed with their distancing parameters and what teachers and families should know about the risk and uh, mitigation strategies. Sure, I think it's important, you know, the, the, just, to, just to clarify this, you know, once and for all, you know, the guidelines that are put out by CDC, the State Department of Health, talk about six feet, you know, when possible, when feasible. And those are very important qualifiers. And the guidance that Bucks County put out said the same thing. Uh, we always say you aim for six feet. Um, and that, but, but of course, we knowing, uh, and this is why this qualifiers are there, that there's many school districts throughout the United States and in Pennsylvania that cannot do a full six feet between, um, between students and actually reopen in person. So that's why those qualifiers, qualifiers, are, qualifiers are there. Uh, and the three feet distance, uh, was put as a floor minimum. Um, I clearly, you know, put, I, I put that in our guidance and there's not a whole lot of other guidance in the state of Pennsylvania that has that three foot floor. Massachusetts and Virginia both do uh, mention that in their guidance for their states. 
but they're not saying aim for three. They're saying aim for six uh, with a minimum of three. And the three foot, um, and I'm happy to get into it if you want a little bit more, but you know, that, that, is a, that, that goes back, there's a lot of research on droplets, right? This, as I said earlier, this is spread by droplets. When you cough, sneeze, talk, there's large respiratory droplets that come out of your mouth and, and they, they come down. In about three feet, a, a vast majority of them do drop out. Now, of course, are there some that could go a little further? Absolutely. Um, and is six feet a little bit better than three? Um, most likely, is 12 feet better, is 15 feet better? And, uh, you know, if me, me and Kaylin probably can't get each other sick right now because we're pretty far from each other. Um, and, and I think that's important to know. So obviously a little bit better, it's always better to be a little bit further. Um, and, and we push that, but there are situations where six feet can't be met. And, there's, there's, and, and there's, there's literally countries around the world that are going back to school, you know, now and in a month, uh, where they will be using three foot as the distance in their schools. Uh, I know there's all kinds of discussions about, well, Europe has it under control, we don't. Um, but I would say that overall, you know, Pennsylvania is doing really well. Uh, and, and I think that the masking order is really important here. Um, the governor's universal masking order allows you to go within that six foot um, amount and still be safe, okay? Um, you know, the whole idea behind masks, we've been talking about this for months, right? If you can't get within, before the masking order, they said, if you, if you can't stay six feet away from someone, make sure you're wearing a mask. Well, in this situation, we're going to be having kids who may or may not be six feet apart in certain situations. They may, they may not be. They will all be wearing masks. And I think that's really important um, to, to get out there that these, we're, not, we're not putting kids in a situation where they'd be sitting four feet from someone without a mask. Um, and then another really important point is here, and I know some people, uh, it's, not only, it's not the only thing. We're also looking at not bringing kids in that are sick. And I know that there's some parents that, that may try to send their kids in and we, we can't stop it. But if I say this, and I think this is really important. If most people do the right thing most of the time, we'll be in pretty good shape. And so bringing kids in that aren't sick to school, they're wearing masks and they're as far apart as possible, whether it's four and a half feet, five feet, whatever it may be, that's gonna keep our kids from spreading it in schools. And that's what we're trying to do. Great. Thank you. So along those lines, your guidance, um, I'm glad that you were able to clarify some of that. Some people feel like your guidance conflicts with the CDC and the Department of Education. And I know that you just touched on that a little bit. If six feet is the goal for social distancing, why was three foot recommended in your guidelines? And so do, do your guidelines conflict with the CDC and, and the Department of Education? Uh, they, they don't. Um, and there was actually an article in the newspaper this week uh, where they actually interviewed the state health department and they, they looked at our plan and they said that they're, they're in agreement. Uh, the reason why I got a little bit of flack for this is because I put that three foot floor. Um, everyone else is saying six feet when feasible. The CDC says that, the Department of Education says that, the Department of Health says that. Um, I was trying to put that in there. So a science-based floor, you can call that. So that's the bare minimum, because again, that's being used around the world. There's a lot of data that shows, and there's a great study in the Lancet that came out in early June uh, that shows that the, the, the risk of infection is clearly uh, less when you move one foot or more away from, from others. Mm -hmm. So um, that it was put out there as, as a bare floor. You gotta stay three feet away from others in the school district and uh, in, in the classroom. And, and, and I've been getting obviously some, some criticism from certain um, groups because I put that floor in there. But if you look at, you know, the state even just came out and said it the other day, that the, our guidance is not pushing three feet, never has been. Our guidance has been saying, get to six if you can, but no less than, than three. So we are not in uh, discordance with the CDC or the State Department of Health guidelines. Thank you. All right, so let's talk um, community spread. How does community spread play a factor? You just mentioned our cases are really low now, but what if that changes? So what is the number, and you may not, know this or have that this in mind, but what is the number of positive COVID cases in our community as far as a percentage that a community might uh, think about, we need to kind of pull back here and reevaluate having kids in school in person? I wouldn't put a percentage on there. Like, you know, tomorrow we might have two people in Bucks County get tested. And if one of them tests positive, that's a 50% positivity rate. So it all depends on how many tests you're running, who's getting tested, you know, what the situation is that week. You know, we focus on, as I said earlier, I look very carefully, and as, twice a day, I look at the hospitalized patients in Bucks County. We got a really good report. Um, twice a day, I get that report, and I look at that very carefully. That, to me, is in some ways the most important uh, aspect, because we're doing all this work to keep people out of hospitals and from getting very sick. 
And of course, some people will. There's no question about it. You know, you can't guarantee that somebody won't get sick and somebody won't die from, from coronavirus in any you know, county in the United States. You, you can never guarantee that. Um, but what we look at is, as I said earlier, when I, when I define pure community spread, we look at when we start seeing people that don't know where they got it. Uh, you know, right you know, today we had someone say, well, I went to this party, went to that party, and someone called me and said that they had, a, they had coronavirus and I was sharing drinks or whatever. You know, that, those kinds of cases are real cases, don't get me wrong, but those are not um, pure community spread. But we start seeing an upsurge of cases where people are just doing their normal thing and they have no idea how they got it. We, so we start to look at that. When we see the community spread, pure community spread numbers go up, we look at that, we look at hospitalizations, obviously. Um, and then once school reopens, and we can get into this, you know, as we go forward, uh, we would start to look at, you know, um, the cases in schools. And I want people to be very clear. There's a big difference between a case in a school versus a case gotten in a school. So, you know, we look at how every case is, is actually infected. And, and, and I said this in a different town hall, and I got a little bit of grief on it when I said, you know, I guarantee you that we will have cases in every school district in Bucks County. And what I said, what I mean that, what I mean exactly what I say is that we have cases now in all of our school district, right? We may not have a lot, but we have, you know, we have a 16 year old, 17 year old, 19 year old, you know, a couple of smaller children throughout the county right now, we have an open school. So we know that kids are going to get sick at some point from COVID, regardless of whether schools are open or not. But what we're trying to put into place are procedures so that if the kid does come to school, they won't spread it to each other, right? If they're wearing a mask and social distancing and we're cleaning the classrooms, that's the whole point is we're not saying there won't be ever a case in the school. We're trying to prevent the spread of those cases once school opens. Makes sense. So I'm going to I'm going to read this question. I just want you to know it wasn't the way I worded it, um, but it has it was definitely a common question. So people want to know why is it OK for school districts to not have to follow? So in, in the governor's orders basically for things like restaurants where they can only have 25 percent capacity and, and you're not allowed to meet in large groups. Um, bars, stores have limitations. So people want to know why not schools? Well, number one, the governor writes those orders and the governor has carved schools out as exceptions for a lot of this. So I can tell you that, you know, you know that the governor has made certain decisions. And I believe a lot of those decisions are being based on the fact that school is, is, is essential. Uh, and we can get into this later too, but school is an essential service. Um, you know, the, 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 it's, he's basically putting them into the same category as grocery stores and you know, kids need to go back to school. He's said it recently, uh, obviously you wanna do it safely, but I believe that's why schools are not being you know, held to the same as a restaurant. A restaurant is not essential technically. You, know, you don't have to go out to eat. Uh, you take your masks off when you're eating at a restaurant. So you know, there's, there's lot, there, there are some differences obviously between a bar and a restaurant and, and a school. Hopefully mm -hmm. kids are not you know, you know, drinking alcohol in, in school. Um, but uh, you know, th there, there are differences and, and the governor has very specifically carved out exceptions for school and other, and there's exceptions for various things throughout his orders um, based on how important that particular activity or event is to actually happen in our society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another question that we had from the community or a board member, I cannot recall. So you stated in the Bucks County Courier Times, while health and safety considerations are paramount, guidance is also rooted in our understanding and the belief that social interaction and person in personal instruction is essential to our children's emotional well-being, as well as their educational growth and advancement. Is that comment based on returning to a normal face-to-face -face school environment where kids are maskless, can socialize with their friends, can play normally and collaborate in small group interactive sessions. Please explain how the same benefits can be found when returning to such an extreme difference in the settings. Sure. I, I think everybody on, this, everybody on this Zoom call, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a staff person, whether you're a parent, whether you're a school member, we all want to get the kids back to school with no restrictions, right? I think that's what it, we all want to go back to what we did a year ago. Or maybe we don't, maybe we don't want the flu to spread in our schools, maybe we want to keep this stuff forever. But but the idea is that that's the Your goal. sound is a little bit muddled. Can you hear me? It's a, it's a little bit muddled. I don't know how to It's like Wait, something there. something clicked and it changed almost. Maybe turn it off, turn it back on the uh, sound. Is that better? Same. No, it's the same. We can talk still here and we should keep going. going. Okay. We can just keep going then. So I guess, so, you know, as I, as I said, I'll just repeat the, the one sentence uh, version of that is that we all want to get the kids back, you know, regularly. I think that's what everyone's goal is. 
when it's all said and done. But we do know that what's happened to these children, you know, over that long, you know, it's still going on. You know, people have been since March, uh, whatever that was, mid-March, the day that they closed all the schools and the students and our children have, have been home. Um, you know, that, that's clearly not, you know, children, when they grow up, when they're with their friends, it, it, it's important for them. They're social animals. Children want to be out with their friends. They want to be doing things. They want to be involved. You know, I think being in school with a teacher, the teachers would all agree with this. I think that they, in a perfect world, you know, uh, assuming they can feel safe, they all want to get the kids back. They know that's the best way to teach. Um, and I think that everyone agrees with that. Um, the question is about, there's other, there's other you know, arguments people can have, but I think everyone wants the kids back because that's what's best for them. And I think pretty much every major organization across the country has agreed with that statement, saying that we want to get the kids back if possible, uh, and, and safely, but that's the best thing for kids. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, you know, I spoke with our children and youth agency, there's, there's obviously increased reports of mental health conditions in children, uh, there's domestic abuse, uh, there's drugs, and there, there's things that we've seen increased, uh, you know, levels of, uh, when children, they're not able to, to maintain the normal social uh, 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 levels that they have. And I think that putting kids in a school, even if they're masked, I think our kids are, are very um, adaptable. I think the kids will get used to it quickly. I know that they will be able to be hugging each other and doing some of the things when they see them every day. But I do believe that um, uh, after a couple of weeks of, of getting used to sort of what's going on, they'll still be with their friends. They'll still be able to socialize, uh, have conversations, be with their teachers uh, in, in an in-person environment. You know, I'm not sure how it's going to work with the virtual choice. You know, I know that everyone's making those choices, what's best for the family. Um, but even that, in that environment, they'll still be able to hopefully, you know, see what's going on in the classroom and feel, mm -hmm. feel a part of it. I, I don't know how it's going to work for each school district. It's different. Um, right. But I do believe that uh, the children that aren't going back in person will still feel that camaraderie that they have with their friends, uh, even if they're wearing masks, even if they're not able to give them the hug, normal hugs that they do. Being with their friends, I believe, has a, has a real uh, social and emotional value uh, that, I, that I think is important. And, and I'm not just saying that myself. There's a lot, again, there's a lot of organizations nationally that, that, that agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. All right. I hate to do this, Dr. Damsker, but you're starting to sound like Darth Vader now. So maybe... It's like echoing. Could you try to maybe exit the call and rejoin us to see if that helps? And I'm so sorry for those in the public. It's okay. Anybody else think he sounded like Darth Vader? No. He said. <laughs> but hard to hear. Hard to hear. Yeah, that was that was definitely a little painful. So let's hope that. Caitlin, you did get a couple more questions on the Q and A. If if you so, want I to. yeah, let me address that, guys. I am trying to. I'm going to try to get through as many of the questions we have already pre-populated. If we yeah. have time, we'll get definitely um, attempt to get through the others. Is that any okay. better or the same? Woo! Okay, it was worth it. Okay, thank you for doing that. Sure. All right. Bear with me. I'm just going to scroll back up here. Okay. Um, have any of the cases of COVID been reported that is that have been reported to have spread among the children and teachers in daycares? Because we know, and we'll talk about this after um, our conversation with you, but there's, and I want people in the public to recognize this as well, because the kids who are not in our schools, who have families that um, are working full time, if Though they, they can afford it. Those kids are going to be in other places with other kids in, in facilities. So have you seen any uh, spread amongst any of the summer camps that have been open the last, the last, you know, several weeks? Yeah, we've, we've, we haven't seen spread. We've, we've seen a couple of cases in the summer camps, but they weren't from the summer camps. Um, you know, we had cases of where the, the siblings or the parents were sick first, gave the kid the disease, the kid went to, you know, went to camp or wasn't able to go to camp. Um, so we felt pretty good about that. And the camps have done a terrific job. Uh, in the heat, uh, we've worked with a lot of camps on their safety protocols. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to be outside 95 degrees with a mask on. Right. Um, you know, just the other day, walking from Quakertown High School to Quakertown Elementary School, you know, I, I tried to Ooh. keep my mask on. And that was, that was a hot walk, right? It I mean, was. It was. It, it's, it's clear, though. But we, we, we have had a couple of cases, but they weren't from, you know, camp spread. 
they were just people who happened to come to camp sick already from their homes. But don't get me wrong, it's not impossible. You know, no one is uh, will ever get on this call saying it's impossible for it to be spread at a, at a summer camp or from small children. Uh, the idea, though, is that our smaller children do seem to have less, they, they clearly have less symptoms and they clearly have less propensity to spread it. But it's not impossible, right? I mean, it, it's, nothing's impossible in medicine, and we never want to say that. Um, but we do, we do know that kids are less uh, likely to be sick, and they, at, least, at least the smaller kids are less likely to spread the disease. And we hope that that trend continues. That actually uh, that helps us with the transition to the next question, which is contact tracing and transmitting the virus to adults. I think a lot of people are worried about that. And, and I know that there's some data out there that supports that that the kids are not as likely to transmit the virus but out of your contact tracing that you've done how many children are suspected of transmitting the virus to adults we, we haven't really had any young kids uh, at all but we have a handful of older to teenagers uh in, in a couple i would say i think it was uh, probably six or seven cases where we know documented and that may have happened more um but we know that if it's a, it's a 16 year old and, and these are household contacts and and we do know that if you have a you know, look if you have a 16 17 18 year old kid uh in someone's home no one's wearing masks no one's cleaning up after you know people are all using the same uh, sinks and refrigerators and bathrooms and people aren't uh, doing the hygiene you know it makes sense that that could be spread mm -hmm. um and is it possible if people go to a party and they share a vape pen they share a beer they share whatever of course you know things can th things can spread um so but we haven't seen a lot of that you know certainly outside of uh, teenagers, which once you're 18 years old, you know, you're basically an adult and 16, 17, 18 year olds um, in, in, in those situations could spread it. The most important thing to remember, though, as I said, I think I said this at the beginning, is we're not talking about people at parties drinking and vaping. We're talking about kids being socially distanced at school, wearing masks in a very structured environment. Um, and because whether no matter what we do in school, it's really important that our that our especially our, you know, the older kids, the seniors, and teenagers, don't go to your kid's house, you know, your friend's house and do, and do, do stupid things and, 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 not, and pretend that COVID doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really even more, that's just as an important point as what we're doing in schools right now is making sure that overall that people keep making good decisions, whether it's, you know, whether it's an 18 year old, whether it's a 48 year old, make good decisions when you're out and about because you can make everybody wear a mask and target and giant. But if, as, soon as, as soon as you get home, you have 20 people in your house and play beer pong then you know we, we can have problems. So I think it's 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 in everyone's best interest to keep doing those things even when they're not in school, and that will help prevent bringing any cases in the first place. Mm -hmm. Kids is, never... is this part of being from New Orleans. What? Was it? <laughs> uh, this is... So, Don't, so Don't Kayla, this is Keith. Can you hear me? I can. Can I ask a quick question to sort of follow up on that? Um, and, and maybe you could touch on it a little bit is really, is that, is that spread less because of, you know, sort of the, the, the viral load that you would suspect uh, in, in patients that are, are less ill uh, as opposed to patients that are severely ill? Uh, you talking about kids, you mean? Yeah, I mean, is that, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we talk a lot about viral load and you hear it once in a while mentioned, um, but but you know a couple questions around the data um and and sort of this low level of ho if, if any hospitalizations um speaks to, to you know what one's got to ask is is why right so either the population of people that are getting it are healthier and therefore able to fend it off like as opposed to the beginning of the epidemic um or, you know, are we seeing, you know, sort of it just muddle around and people aren't as sick, but they are just sort of passing it along in, in a lesser amount? Is there any thought yeah, I, don't, I don't know whether viral load has anything to do with it, but I can tell you, especially like in small children, if you're a three-year-old with COVID and, you know, you're, you're, you're talking, you're, you're, very, you're very low to the ground. So and this is sort of a physics thing, right? I mean, I'm not a physics right. teacher by any stretch, um, but I did stay at Holiday Express last night. The, 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 the droplets do go down. Uh, you know, by gravity. So spreading to adults would make would make actually sense. If a three year old, you know, with a parent, you know, they're not going to be uh, the droplets going to go down. Whether it's three feet or six feet, they're still going to drop to the ground. Uh, and like you said earlier, when you're not when, you, when you're asymptomatic, when you're very mildly symptomatic, they, they there is there is some theories out there that those people are not shedding as much uh, as someone who's very sick. But I don't think there's been I don't think you can we can prove that scientifically where measure you know viral loads. There is there are some studies showing that that less 
uh, the people that are symptomatic do clear the disease faster. So we know that people that are asymptomatic, uh, and China did a nice study on that showing that, you know, that the, 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 there are fewer days, the, the nasal, the uh, swab is negative for, in fewer days of those that were mildly symptomatic versus those that were more symptomatic. They, they kind of recover quicker. It's hard to know whether they're shedding it as much or not, but they do recover quicker. And I think that's important that they're not out uh, infectious as long a period as someone who's more symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope that helps a little bit, but. Um, so we know masks are important. We also know that this, the Pennsylvania Department of Education recently said that that face shields could be used in place of masks. And I know there's a lot of concern about that from especially our teachers. They're concerned that it doesn't offer enough protection. So I wanted to know what your recommendations were in regards to masks versus face shields. Yeah, and I think that the most important thing is we want parents to feel comfortable. Just like their choice between in-person and virtual, we want the parents to feel comfortable. Uh, the, the face shields are the, the, the good study that was done, the major the study that was done you know, several years ago shows that, you know, if I were to cough in your face and you're wearing a face shield, it provides really good protection. You know, it gives you eye protection that masks don't do. And we know that if you get coronavirus or other viruses on your hand and rub your eye, you can certainly inoculate yourself and, and, and get sick from that. And, and that's how one of the reasons people get sick. So we know that masks are good for protection purposes. And this is assuming they're worn properly. Uh, you know, if you, if you flip your face shield up, just like you were, if you pull your mask down, right? And I said this in, in the newspaper article the day, you know, any mask, if you're not wearing a mask correctly, you, know, might, you might as well not be wearing one, right? So face shields, I believe, are a little more comfortable to wear for kids. Uh, it gives eye protection. And if you wear it properly, uh, you know, people are saying, that the reason why the CDC isn't sure whether they should recommend it or not, it, it talks about source control. And so that source control means if, I'm, if I have coronavirus and I'm wearing a, a face mask and I cough or sneeze into that mask, it's stopping particles from going places and that helps prevent the whole room from, from getting sick. However, if you're wearing a properly fitted face shield that goes below your chin, wraps around, if I you know, cough or sneeze into a face shield, that's a solid plastic impermeable surface. That's gonna stop droplets too. And, and the reason why there's not big studies on face shields because up until a few months ago, nobody was wearing masks and face shields anywhere except for hospitals, right? And so in hospitals, there's a difference. You know, you might hear from a nurse saying, well, when I'm in the hospital, I always wear a mask and a face shield because they're, they're dealing with COVID patients. They're doing, you know, things that aerosolize um, and, and those need N95s. Um, and, and so face shields in a hospital setting is different than being in a community setting. Um, and again, the, the governor's order obviously allows it. So right there, that's the answer that, you know, that's the real answer is the governor's order allows it. But there's also clearly this, there's some protective value, uh, you know, for your eyes. Uh, and if you do cough, talk, or sneeze, you're, you're going right, if you're wearing it correctly, it's going right into a solid surface. And those droplets hit the solid surface and they go down. And they go down by gravity too. So there, there's definitely, um, you know, logic will tell you that they do things, that they, they do help, they do help. And what we also discussed, you know, in classroom settings, if you have a young child who doesn't want to wear the mask and every time that the teacher's talking, they keep pulling it down, you know, they're, they're potentially, depending on what's in their hands, they're contaminating the mask. They're not easy to clean. A face shield, you can wipe it down with soap and water. You can wipe it down with an alcohol wipe and actually sanitize it. So they're reusable. Uh, they're e easy to sanitize. And you can actually have a conversation with someone without pulling masks down. I mean, every day I see it all over the place. Every time someone wants to have a discussion with someone, they pull the mask down. And you don't have to do that with a face shield. Uh, if a teacher wants to see the facial expression on a child, you know, they're, they're doing a math problem on the board and little Johnny not getting it. He's like, has a puzzled look. If all you can see is their eyes, it's very difficult to pick that out. And look, I'm not an educator. There's people on this call that have a lot more knowledge and that I all, that all, they've forgotten more than I'll know about education. But I'm pretty sure they, that looking at kids' faces has an impact on the teaching that they're doing. Uh, sure. I, so I've been in meetings where I'm looking at people's faces when I'm talking to them and I can see their expressions and it helps guide what you're doing as the next step in when you're teaching. So um, I think face shields provide a lot of, a lot of benefits. And the county is going to be providing face shields for anyone who decides that's what they want to wear, but they're absolutely not mandatory. Uh, if a parent wants their child to wear a face mask, they can wear a face mask and a face shield if they want to. Um, there's, there's, there, this is not something we're, we're, we're recommending or requiring. We're providing them because we feel we know that it's an acceptable alternative and there's definitely some benefits to wearing them. Uh, and, and anyone who wants to see a study comparing face shields and face and cloth masks isn't going to see it because this entire situation just started a couple of months ago. 
uh, and, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But we, but we do believe there's a lot of benefits to wearing a face shield if that's what a parent chooses to do. Sure. A lot of parents are also concerned about the amount of time that kids have to wear a mask. And, you know, I think most adults struggle with wearing a mask for long periods of time. So there's some guidance around mask breaks. And tell us your thoughts on that. Sure. I have five different things that I wear. I have a neck gaiter, I have a face shield, I have a surgical mask, and I have an eagle's mask. Uh, I don't like to wear masks for eight hours straight myself. I find them, I find it difficult. So I, I switch it up. And I advise anyone to have multiple things available. So maybe some of the children can wear their face shield part of the day, their mask part of the day, and kind of varied up. Um, but the mask breaks are important. So in, in, in our schools, at any point, the kids are six feet apart or further, they can take off their masks for a mask break. Now, the, the length of the mask break hasn't been defined yet. It's sort of up to each individual school district. Uh, if they're eating lunch, then they can, if they're six feet away, they can take their masks off to eat lunch or the mask. Those are the two situations where they can remove them. Or if they're outside and they're six feet or more, they can also remove their masks. And I, and I, and I think that's going to be really important, especially, you know, over the next month or two while it's still hot outside. Um, but I think they're important, you know. I, I think it's difficult, and I know people that work with masks on all day long in the healthcare field. I know many people. And um, it, it, it is, they all want, they do want to take a break, whether it's at lunchtime, whether it's break time. Uh, I don't think anyone loves wearing masks all day long. Um, I'm, I, I, there could be someone out there, but I don't know anyone who actually prefers to wear one. So I think it's important for anyone in any situation to be able to take a mask break. Uh, and especially our younger children. I think if you give them the ability to say, hey, look, we're gonna be taking breaks on a regular basis, um, depending on what school you're in, you may be able to move the chairs. And we did this when we, um, you know, the other day uh, with, when we visited the schools. Uh, if you're able to be four or five feet apart, you may be able to move the desks. Just, you know, each kid can move the desk back, you know, a few inches and separate out and possibly in the room, depending on how it's set up. And maybe they can put tape on the floor to show where you can move for your mask break position. Uh, there's all kinds of things I think teachers can do. Because uh, even if you're not at six feet the entire day, you can, you can maybe come up with a way in your room to be six feet apart. Uh, or you can have the children, some of the children can stand up and go to different parts of the room, uh, separate out for the mask break and make sure we're all six feet apart. But I think that's up to each individual teacher and principal and school district to figure out ways to make that happen. But I'm a firm believer that, you know, children should be practicing wearing their masks when they're not in school and they kind of get used to wearing them. Um, you don't want to put a kid in school for the first time having never worn a mask. Uh, that, you're, you're sort of setting them up you know, to have difficulty with that. So I would recommend to all parents out there, Make sure, you make sure your kids are practicing, even at home. You know, have them, have them work, wear it for a couple hours at a time and get used to wearing it because uh, I'm pretty confident the governor's order is not going to go away anytime soon. I think kids will, and while all of us will be wearing masks into the foreseeable future, uh, you know, certainly until the end of the year, possibly longer, uh, depending on what happens. Um, so, uh, again, it, it's give the kids options, figure out what's best for them. A kid who's wearing a mask that they feel comfortable wearing is one that they're going to wear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, recess. A lot of teachers are thinking, oh my gosh, if my kids don't have recess, that's going to be, that's going to be a nightmare because kids need to get that energy out. They're asking all sorts of questions. What are we going to do at recess? Do we need to wear a mask? Do you, you know, what are your recommendations? Do you think kids should have, still have their recess and what guidance can you give us on that? Yeah, I, recess is extremely important. Uh, you know, being in school all day, uh, you know, kids are kids. They need a little bit of time. Even the older kids need some kind of, you know, break time to, to divorce themselves from the math and the science and everything else. Uh, and I think that recess is extremely important. I think what we need to start looking at are some activities that don't require the kids to be as close as they normally are. Uh, but I can tell you right now, being outside, just in general, is, is extremely, is way less risky. It's, we're, we're seeing, you know, the, 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 the cases that we get you know, I can't say for sure if we've ever had an outside exposure, but we haven't really been able to pinpoint too many pure outside exposures. You know, we had we had the protest that occurred, um, you know, and we, we, in Bucks County anyway, now we can't say for sure because somebody may have not told us the truth about where they were, where they weren't, but we really didn't see any cases um, from those protests. And a lot of people were wearing masks, a lot of people were social distancing, not everybody was, clearly. Um, but being outside, there's no doubt about it that that's a safer place to be. So anytime you can get the kids outside, whether it's teaching the class partly outside, whether it's having the kids out for recess, um, it is a good thing. And I think the kids should do their best to play games that don't require them to be, you know, right in each other's faces. You know, even something like basketball, 
You know, you can have kids shoot around. They can share the same basketball as long as they're washing their hands before and after. And there's games that you can play that don't require you to be face to face. But look, smaller kids are smaller kids. Uh, and, and, and on a really hot day, if you have a bunch of five, six, seven year olds, I'm not going to I'm not going to lie. I think it's going to be difficult for the, for the recess monitors, the teachers to keep an eye on every second. But remember, an exposure for, for coronavirus is being within six feet of somebody for 15 minutes or more. Now, that was going to be, be a question. Yeah, I had, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's that's the definition of, of an exposure. Now, that's not to say if I cough right in your face or, you know, share a cigarette with you or something, God forbid, um, you know, that there are things that could be considered exposure that are inside of that time. But overall, if kids are running around outside and they run past each other or they play a quick game with each other outside, that's not really going to be considered a close exposure. So I think there's a little bit more flexibility uh, when the kids are outside. Obviously, it has to be monitored and, and, and carefully watched. But um, I, I, I think that we absolutely have to give the, give the kids a chance to, um, to be with each other and, and have the social aspects. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, what's your recommendation if a teacher or student tests positive? Who makes that decision when, if the rest of the cl you know, class would be, need to be quarantined or if a, if a teacher, um, any, if a teacher or a student gets infected, what process should we consider to make that determination? Yeah, and our guidance, we feel very strongly that we're trying not to interrupt the classroom teaching as much as possible. So if, if we end up having uh, a child, especially especially one that's getting sick. We'll start with talking about people that get sick from outside of school, which is what most of, which I believe is what we'll end up seeing for the most part. So a child, you know, ends up um, getting it from their parents who, you know, went to Florida or whatever. They get it from the child comes into school, uh, does their normal day, goes home, gets sick that night, gets tested, and ends up having COVID. Uh, our, our, our role is to obviously we find out who in that classroom is at higher risk, who is exposed to that child, but what we're trying to do is something called modified quarantine. And this is something that is, it's, it was difficult for us to do this months ago because not everybody's wearing a mask. But we've been doing this with first responders, hospital staff, essential workers for months. And it's worked out really, really well. And what that means is uh, you, you, you go to school, uh, the kids will still go back to class, but they have to wear the masks at all times, uh, except when they are in very rare times that they have to eat to try to separate the kids out in that, in that classroom where it was. Just be really careful. It's basically similar to what they're doing already, but just a little bit more careful that the kids, when they take their masks off, you know, you may have to at recess, you have to be a little bit more specific about what they're doing. And these are just kids that were exposed potentially. Uh, but remember, when we're being exposed to these kids in the classroom with a teacher, everyone's wearing a mask already. So none of these exposures should be high risk. And that's important for me to get this across. We're not talking about someone who coughed in someone's face without a mask. We're talking about a group of kids that all is masked during the school day, including the teacher. So if some, one of those children ends up becoming positive you know, from an exposure they had at their house or whatever, that child, if everyone was masked, the, it's a very low risk exposure. And we don't, want, we don't want to shut down schools. We don't want to shut down classrooms every single time there's a case. Uh, and, and I know the CDC has, has given guidance recently and they're, they're, they're also sort of saying the same thing. It's important, it's, it's, it's extremely destructive and detrimental to kids to have them go back at home for 14 days and come back. And then you sit out for 14 days and on day 15, another kid in a different classroom gets sick and then you, you, it becomes extremely disruptive. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the parents are choosing virtual because they think that's what's gonna happen. And, and, I'm, and, and our guidance is not to do that. The only time we would consider closing a classroom or a school or anything is if we start to see inter-school inter cases where we see five cases in a classroom or something where those kids aren't hanging out outside of school. And this is why we do contact tracing. You know, you may have three 18-year-old seniors at Quakertown High School and they all get sick and we think, oh my God, it must be from school. Well, it turns out that all three of them went to the party at, at Bobby's house over the weekend, got sick there and came to school. So a lot of what we're doing is that's part of what contact tracing is so important is we're looking to see where they got infected. So having a case in your school doesn't mean that it's spread in your school. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really important. And if we're all wearing masks and social distancing, we don't anticipate to see having higher numbers of spread in school. That's why we're trying to keep things as they are, put the kids into a, something called, again, a modified quarantine and, and not shut everything down. Uh, and again, that's when we'll start to worry. You said earlier, what, what, are, what are some of the things we look for? Hospitalizations and community spread. Well, in a school situation, we start to look for a spread within a school. And if we start to see that while we're masked and while we're social distancing, then we have to, we look, we have to start saying, step back and say, okay, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Are they not following the rules? Is something going on? And that's where we take a more serious look. But just having a case here and there 
you know, we feel strongly that, that we don't want to disrupt the entire situation from, now again, if a teacher's sick, um, you know, and that's up to the, each individual school district. Yeah, they may be able to teach a Zoom class from home. I'm not sure. I, I don't want to get into that because that's not, that's not what we do. Uh, but we believe that that, you know, that, that classroom can continue. Uh, in, 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 in a, uh, those kids can still be in classroom, depending on how each school district does it. I can't speak to how Quakertown would do it or how you know, any other school district would do it, but th there's, there's possibilities without having to say, you guys are going home for 14 days mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and you know, take away from that experience of you know, ping-ponging back and forth. So what if a kid doesn't have COVID? Maybe they have a cold. Sure. And it's interesting that the state guidelines that just came out the other day uh, address this exact thing. They said that if a child has symptoms, whether it's a fever, whether it's, or, or anything else like a runny nose, if there's no known exposure to COVID, whether it's from another student, whether it's from a family member or you know, anything, they're saying 24 hours of having no fever or symptoms, that child can come back to school and the testing is not required. And, and, and I think it's put in there specifically for that kind of thing, where we know kids are gonna have you know, a headache sometimes or a tummy ache or they may you know, have a stuffy nose for a day. Um, and the state, the state guidance put that out just last week in, in, the, in that full PA guidance, which is, um, I believe that's what they're trying to do. They're trying not to keep a kid out every time they have a headache, because we know that. And the school nurses are a huge part of this. I, I, I think the teachers, again, I have respect for every person coming, having to come back to work. I know some people are scared, but our school nurses are the, the ones that are gonna be working with a lot of these kids. Uh, and I want them to feel protected. I want them to have good guidance. I'm trying to meet with all the school nurse um, directors. Uh, it's several times we've already done that uh, via conference call. But I, I do believe that you know things like allergies, right? You know, there's kids that they have a they have a runny nose every spring and every fall, and things like letting your school nurse know ahead of time that little Johnny has allergies. You know, give him a Claritin. Um, you know, when he gets home from school, if, if, they, if the symptoms improve, then you know, okay, it's most likely allergies. If you have a kid who is a little bit short of breath because they have asthma, use their inhaler. If their symptoms improve, great. Um, but we, what we've seen is some of the kids in our cases here in Buck County is people say, you know, I have allergies, but this doesn't feel like my allergies, you know, or I've taken my Claritin or my Zyrtec and it didn't really get me better. Or my, my asthma normally gets better when I use my inhaler and it didn't get me better. And those are the people that end up having coronavirus a lot of times. We, and it's not just in kids, it's in adults. We, because this is why, because we talked to all of our cases, we've seen how this goes. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important that we don't, you know, every kid who's got a headache doesn't mean they have coronavirus. And, and, and the school nurses are, and the teachers are really important in all this. Uh, and that rule that the state put out allows us, again, this is not someone whose family member is positive with COVID. This is someone who has no known exposure to COVID. Um, it allows those kids to come back 24 hours after re uh, resolving their fever or symptom that they had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that during lunch that our kids would need to, um, that they would be able to take off their mask, as long as they're socially distant, and, and obviously we're going to be doing that in the classroom. Uh, there's some concerns around that. Uh, someone mentioned, they said, I know that kids need help with certain things at lunchtime, messes that are made naturally. While eating, no one will have a mask on, and we won't be spread out as we would be in a cafeteria. What do you suggest to teachers and staff helping in monitoring lunch in a classroom that would keep everyone safe and healthy? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I wish I had the exact answer for you on that. Um, obviously, you know, whatever teacher is going to be within six feet of the children, they have to put their PPE back on, they put their mask on. Uh, you know, and I agree, in, in the first, second, third grade, there's maybe some issues, people spill things, they do things, because we've never really ate much in our classroom, so it'll be new for everybody. Um, and, and hopefully, once the kids get used to being, hopefully, as independent as possible, you know, opening their own lunchbox, doing the things they normally do, over time, the teachers won't have to approach them as much during those breaks. But I understand, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. yeah, as most stuff. important thing is when the teacher goes to help a child out and they have to be wearing their mask and we can actually ask the child briefly hey put your face shield back on put your mask back on while the teacher comes to help so they're both are masked during that interaction mm -hmm. uh, while they're helping clean up the mask or whatever situation happens but we do want you know whenever the students are coming close together face to face with the teacher or others they should both put their mask back on even if it's just for a, you know just for 20 seconds to, to fix whatever the problem is and then take it off uh, and that's one advantage to a face shield I think of. You, you can actually sip through a straw wearing your face shield, but um, <laughs> you know, class. But I agree. I mean, it, it's a good question, and I appreciate the teachers being concerned, but I believe that the most important thing is when they do help, that mm -hmm. put mask back on the child and the teachers keep their mask on while, you know, helping whatever they're doing. That's a good idea. Shields during lunch. Hmm. 
maybe. Um, that might be a little difficult, but maybe it's a good idea. So, uh, so some teachers, especially elementary school teachers that I'm talking to that have younger ones, they're constantly, you know, when, the, when kids get back to school, they're sad. They miss their mom and dad. They're crying. Teachers are so used to hugging and comforting kids. They're used to bending over and helping them learn how to use a pencil for the first time. Sure. So that's going to change, obviously, to some extent with the new model. But do you think that if a teacher were to briefly interact with a child and both people are wearing a mask, what level of risk do you think would be involved in that interaction? Remember, as I said earlier, when both people are wearing masks, you know, it, it's got to be, it's got to be, it's, it's, it's the extended period of time. It's that 15 minutes, close face-to-face -face contact for 15 minutes. That's what the CDC uh, calls a close exposure. Now, again, if, if, if a child is sobbing, crying, and they end up, you know, hugging the child, you know, that's a, that's a high-risk exposure. But if, the, if everyone's wearing a mask, obviously you're, you're reducing the risk. Um, you know, I can't say that every, that nothing, nothing I can say will reduce all risk in a classroom. Uh, and I know our teachers want to help. I mean, this is why they're teachers, because they care about the kids. Uh, and I know they feel strongly that sometimes you're going to have a young child crying in the classroom. And I think you do your best. Uh, it feels cold almost to say, I'm going to comfort you, but I'm wearing my mask and my face shield while I'm comforting you, right? It feels a little cold, but um, I think that for right now, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it probably has to happen. The teachers have to feel comfortable, you know, helping kids out. The, the kids may be crying wearing a mask or a face shield. Um, and that's and that's one advantage. So if you get tears inside of a face shield, you can we can take it off, we can wash it off, right? That's one advantage. But I, I agree. It, it, these are these are really good questions. These are not questions that I have answers to from a public health perspective. But I can tell you though that they have to just focus on keeping themselves safe, keeping their PPE on as much as they want to take it off, as much as they want to give the kids a hug. Um, focus on you know, what can I do to reduce the, the risk of, of transmission, and um, you know putting a hand on a child's shoulder. Maybe there's things that they can do. Um, but again, it's, I, I don't have all the answers and it's not going to be easy. No question about it. Sure. Sure. Bussing. Someone did ask this, but I don't know that this is what we're recommending that students sit directly next to each other on a school bus, unless they're in the same household, right? Two, two per seat is what we're rec is what we said we would accept. What right. is your recommendation on that? Dr. Dancer. Yeah, it, it, the most important thing, uh, you know, is you, you, you have two people on a seat, and it doesn't quite give you the three feet. You are within, most likely, they'll be a little bit closer than three feet. I haven't measured. Um, you know, it depends on the size of the kids. If you have two high school kids, they can't be as far away as, you know, two first grade kids. They can space a little bit better. Uh, but obviously, really important on a bus, and, and the, the buses that I've been on anyway, you know, all the windows can crack and open, and getting that ventilation going in that bus is really, really important. So if we have good ventilation on a bus, we have um, uh, the kids all masked at all times, uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a distinct short period of time. You know, it could be 15, 20 minutes. It's hard to know because every route's different. I know the school districts, at least some of them anyway, are trying to minimize the length of time the kids are on buses. They're adding routes. They're doing different things to minimize the number of children on a bus. Um, but if kids are wearing masks, this is a short, defined period of time. You're increasing the ventilation as much as possible. Have, like you said, have siblings sit next to each other whenever possible. It's not always possible. You know, that's what we can do to minimize. Um, you know, because the idea that we could put, you know, one child per row or every other row, I don't think any school district in, in Bucks County could adequately bus the kids to school either. So th this is an essential service. You know, uh, some parents, thankfully, are taking their kids to school. I know that the school districts have put out surveys and there's a lot of parents that have decided, well, you know what, I can take my kids to school. I'll do that. And that'll help lower the, the density on the buses. And we're hoping that will help enough in Quaker Town and other places. Um, but again, this is, these are these are short um, these are short defined spaces of, of time, uh, and and you know they go as close as three feet as they can. Um, but wearing that mask is the key part of that. Some people are asking about screening, and I know I, I believe that the recommendation is is not that we do that. And so let the public know why that is the recommendation. What's the thought behind that? Yeah, well, first I can tell you start with temperature screening. Is that we know because I got that question all the time. Yeah, temperature in, in, screening. Yeah, in the, in the, in the, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes, temperature, temperature screening. screening, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we do want a symptom screen, right? We still want to screen, but yeah. Yes. Okay. But, but temperature screening is, 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 is we've seen it. And this goes in, even in, in children and adults to a large degree that the majority of people either don't ever have a fever with coronavirus, or if they do have a fever, they've had multiple other symptoms uh, before they got that fever. So they're going to, they're going to have a loss of taste and smell and the runny nose and the headache uh, and the cough or whatever. 
then they get a fever often longer into their into their disease and, and a lot of people literally never have a fever they have a normal temperature the entire time they're sick with coronavirus so um it's a, it's sort of a a two-pronged problem number one it, it, it gives you a false sense of security uh because you say oh little johnny doesn't have a temperature today he must not have covid and in reality we know that that's not a good way of screening and the second thing is obviously if you have 500 kids in a school you know, having them somehow be temperature screened when you're trying to get them in, that actually causes, you know, a social distancing issue when they're all crowded around the front of the school trying to get in. Um, so it's not something that we've found to be uh, recommended. Uh, I believe the CDC and the State Department of Health also don't recommend it. Um, so um, I think that we're doing the right thing here in, in Quakertown by not doing temperature screening of students and staff. But again, I can't emphasize this enough. It's the parents, they have to do the, they have to do the right thing. Um, I know that not every parent will always do the right thing. And it's easy to say because some parents, if they don't go to work, they can lose their job. They don't have sick time. And I know it's a, it's a real problem. But it, it, I can't emphasize it, 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 this anymore, that we're relying on our parents and our students to be honest about their symptoms and not go to school if they're sick. Mm -hmm. And we know that, that traditionally people do that. And that's why we have flu outbreaks. Flu spreads easy, you know, flu, we do have outbreaks of flu in our schools at times. And, and norovirus, the diarrhea virus, and we, we, have, we have things that happen. And it's, it, it, especially for the next several months, when we're going, when we're trying to reopen schools, when we're trying to make a dent in this virus, um, people have to be, take this extremely seriously and say, look, I know my, I know my son's not feeling well, but he's, he's got a test today or he's got whatever, you know, this is where the virtual model could potentially be helpful. Again, every school district is different in how they're doing it, but we think it's really important that, that just don't send your kids to school sick. Um, and if we don't do, if we all do that, if we, most of us do it most of the time, I keep saying that because it's important, we're going to prevent the spread of disease in, in, in our schools. Sure. Uh, and I, I just can't emphasize that enough. I know it's not easy. It's something that we traditionally haven't done. We've kind of, you know, give the kid, the, you've heard the story, you give the kid the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, send them to school, and by the time they have a fever, school day's over, eh, whatever. Those days have to be over now. Uh, and again, I know that it's, it's easy for me to say because I'm not the one who's, you know, I could lose my job if my kid, you know, if I, if I have to stay with my kid. And I know it's, it's, it's a very difficult spot people are in sometimes. Um, but again, that's, that's, this whole thing works if we, if, if we do that. Sure. Testing is gonna be a critical part, I think, of all of this. And some people have been saying, you know, gosh, it's taken me five days to get my test back recently. What is, uh, what is your department thinking in terms of how to make, how are we going to make that better, especially with the influx of potential, you know, tests that are going to take place when we reopen schools? Yeah, the, right now, the one lab that's killing us is Quest. And CVS is using that in a lot of their situations and, and the places that a lot of people go into CVS because a lot of CVS is, and it's not CVS's fault per se, it's because Quest is a, is a national laboratory and they're getting hammered by Florida, Arizona, Texas, the other states that are having their big outbreaks right now. Uh, and I think I said, I don't know if I said this earlier, but it's important that we, we already had our outbreak. So this is why we're doing better than some of these other states that never had their big outbreak. But so they're kind of going through theirs now. They're starting to, to peak and now they're starting to plateau. So hopefully those states will start doing better. Um, Quest did say they're opening up additional you know, facilities, hopefully to start getting those times down. Uh, but it doesn't do any good. If I go get tested on June, if I go get tested on July 1st, and my test doesn't come back till July 15th, I'm already, I've already done my 10 days of isolation. I'm already clear before my test even came back, right? Even if I had coronavirus. So it doesn't do a lot of good. It makes contact tracing more difficult. So what I'm gonna try to do is, and this is, it doesn't help Quakertown as much, but I'm working with, there's a lab in the lower end of the county uh, near Oxford Valley Mall. We're gonna be working with them to uh, open up hopefully five to six days a week. Uh, I may even be able to write a script for all Bucks County students and staff, like a standing order, where you could go under my prescription and get tested. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that it, it may not help you as much if it's next to Oxford Valley Mall, but we're working with this. We want to have an ability for these schools to have quick turnaround testing because you're right. There, there, there's a real concern with Quest, and Quest is one of the largest labs in the country. But LabCorp is doing better. Um, just today, we had multiple results back where people were tested on the 27th. So that's really just two days. So I think that there are some labs that, have, that, have, that are doing better. We're seeing an ink, uh, the, the testing time has gotten better from a lot of different labs, but Quest is the one that it happens to be very commonly used. And people are frustrated, and I totally get it. But I'm also going to work with, I'm going to try to find a location in the upper part of the county that will help our school districts up there, that we can do something similar, where it can't be everybody. It can't be for all the families, too, but it could be for the actual staff and or the students 
that could able to, to, to get a test with a quick turnaround. Uh, and I'm working through that. It may not, it's not as easy as it sounds uh, because a lot of primary care doctors won't even give you a script unless you have symptoms. And, there, and, and, and this wouldn't be for people just to get random tests because they feel like it. There, there should be a reason why. We're not, we're not saying just, you know, every day I'm gonna go get a test today. It's gotta be for people that have a real reason to go. And we can get into the details of that procedure, you know, as we get forward. But I am working on that. Um, again, I know it's a problem. And there's nothing worse than getting a test back two weeks after you were tested because you've already been home for the entire 10 days. You're already over coronavirus. And you, we may, you know, it, it doesn't do anybody any good. So sure. we understand it's a problem and we are working on that. Great, great. It's about 7.30 almost. And I haven't, I apologize to, to the rest of the public. There's still a couple of questions left, but at this time, I do feel like it's fair. I know some board members probably, I don't want to keep you past eight o'clock at all. You committed an hour and I'm kind of stealing two here. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to open it up to other board members. We did cover a lot of information, but I'm sure that they might directly want to ask you a question or two. So I will open up the floor to board members who want to ask some questions I got I got a quick one because I, I I've spoke to Dave or Dr. Demansker a few times uh, leading up to this and I was part of the tour on Monday so a lot of my questions were answered then but the one thing I, I did want to uh, have him speak a little more on is when we were um, staging these rooms and it, it looks really promising that we would be able to achieve getting most of our students back at four and a half to five foot of spacing. And that's with, you know, we were basically not even counting any virtual students. We were taking the full enrollment from last year's classes and still getting four and a half to five feet of spacing. So you would feel comfortable having us send our kids back with four and a half foot to five foot of spacing if they stayed masked. And even if we did achieve six foot, try to keep them masked anyway um just to help to prevent the the spread of the disease any further correct you know and, and the governor's order does require that even if you are six feet apart you're supposed to remain masked except for the mask breaks or, or eating lunch and again the mask breaks that's up to the school district to figure that out how long they are but the six feet is important right this once you're six feet away the vast majority of droplets go at three there's a few more that go to six um and and, and that that is a safe way of, of being and and um, you know, I think it's important. There's a picture, I think, of some of us sitting at the chairs. Yeah, Kaylin you know, got those it, pictures. That's why I was. I was and I think it's great. If you can put one of those up, I, she she said she texted me one. I think it was great. Um, yeah. You know, and these are adults sitting in chairs that are made for for much smaller kids. And if and I think if the average person looked at, at this picture, it, it, the distance actually looks reasonable. Uh, I certainly would feel comfortable, you know, being in a situation like that. I know I, I certainly would feel comfortable putting, you know, my children in a situation like that. Uh, it does far exceed because the difference is people are thinking three feet. It's, if you do three feet from a desk edge to desk edge, remember that gives you the additional space um, to the middle of that desk where the child is actually sitting. The child's not sitting at the edge of the desk; they're sitting at the middle of the desk. So that's why the three foot desk edge to desk edge becomes four and a half feet, or even longer, depending on how big the desk is. Yeah. Uh, and, and and again, uh, looking at those pictures uh, and sitting in those chairs and feeling the distance, I think that is a safe distance. Absolutely. Yeah. So four and a half to five feet, if we could achieve that across the district, I felt comfortable seeing that much more than I did when we tried the desk at three feet center to center. It, it definitely did look tight, but, you know, certainly at five feet and at six feet, it, it would even be better if we could reach that. Yeah. And I think if we, we actually moved the desks at one point, six feet desk edge to desk edge. And I think you could fit like three people in the classroom. You know, it, it was almost... Right that's actually closer to like eight feet, you know, seven and a half, eight feet, if you do six foot edge to edge. Um, but I do believe that, you know, the four and a half, five feet, it's clearly over the floor minimum that, we, that, we've, that we've allowed. Uh, and it's, it's pretty darn close to the six feet. Uh, and again, six feet's okay. People are, throughout the country, when they're six feet apart, they're removing their masks in meetings and other places. Um, you know, the governor's order here in Pennsylvania that says to keep it on inside all the time, which is what we'll do. But um, you know, you're getting pretty close to that six foot distance. And I believe uh, that that you can you can open up safely when everyone's keeping their masks on at all times when you're within that six feet. Well, we have some teachers and and other people that have been saying you know anything below six feet is just unsafe. So you're refuting that then. Well, I am. And and if you talk to the CDC, you talk to the, the state of Pennsylvania, they will say that you do the best you can to reach it. 
but no one is saying that if you go, you know, a foot below six feet, everyone's going to get sick. No one's saying that. Uh, I think that's important to remember that, that, that the guidance has been very clear. Um, you know, I, I believe that you know, the CDC said that again recently that, you know, don't get hung up on the six feet. It's you separate, you go as close as you can to it and you follow the other guidelines, sanitation, masking, and social distancing all in combination is what we're looking at here. It's not just one thing. And I, I don't want anyone to get hung up on that one particular thing. Yeah. Can I interject here? If it's under six feet, doctor, um, does that mean that you need to stay masked? My understanding is that the rec recommendation is to wear a mask at all times. Correct. If you're under six feet, you must remain masked. That's correct. Dr. Damster, uh, do you have a sense for any kind of metrics about number of cases that might be concurrent in our school district? or you know, in our staff and kids that would raise your alarm bells and conversely, any kind of, hey, look, nothing's happened for six months. Maybe we can relax. Like, have you studied or come up with any of those kind of guidelines yet? Well, I think what we can say is, uh, again, what, what worries me, I, th I think I mentioned this earlier, is if we start seeing spread in the school, not from outside of the party, not from a teacher getting it from their wife, but from an actual spread within the school. And, we'll, and we have to look at it, why did that happen? And if we can figure out what happened, okay, maybe a bunch of kids didn't wear their masks or shared a drink or something they shouldn't have done, or was it just, you know, it's starting to spread in schools. And we don't think that'll happen, but we, we're, always, we're always looking for that. This is why we're doing the investigations to see what's gonna happen. Now, there's a, a lot of the countries in Europe, they, some of them started off doing different things. You know, I know uh, Denmark, for instance, started off doing six feet. Then they realized that there wasn't any problems, they went down to three feet. Uh, and then they, some of the some of the schools in Europe are going to open up with no masking in three feet. So you know, the, the, I think, but it takes sometimes it takes a month or two to go. And I, I agree, we'll be looking at that all across any every school district that has in person teaching, whether it's full in person, whether it's a hybrid model. We're going to be monitoring this extremely closely. We're spending a lot of time on schools because we kind of know the data now. We know what's going on in other places. So we have, I, I'm going to have some nurses and myself. We're going to be focusing a lot of our attention and energy on our schools and monitoring things. And if we see Hey, we're not seeing any spread in schools, and I'm seeing, I'm sure the state will also notice that, you know, statewide, because I can't override the governor's order. Uh, they might decide to say, "Hey, we're okay with three feet," and start with that, and say, "Everyone keep a mask on, but the three feet can be can be shrunken." Or they might say, "We're getting rid of all, you know, distancing guidelines, but everyone still has to keep their mask on." And there's there's, there's several options that could happen, uh, and that's that's not an unreasonable thing either to say, you know, we're we're keeping everyone's mask on at all times, but we're going to eliminate the three foot minimum or and the state wouldn't even say that because they haven't admitted the three foot minimum anyway right but um but overall i believe that it's going to take a little bit of time uh, we're going to see hopefully that if we're all following the rules and following what we're supposed to do that we're not going to see transmission in schools can't say it won't ever happen uh, again i never say it never in medicine because as soon as you say it never happens it happens uh, but but we do feel comfortable um given everything that's happened in other places uh, that if we do all these techniques, we can keep the, the intra-school intra spread down. Got it. Yeah, well, thank you. Sure. Uh, doctor, I have to interject here and ask a question because a, a lot of comparisons are made to the studies in Europe. But um, our situation here locally, I agree, is, is pretty decent. But as a country, wouldn't you agree that we cannot be compared to Europe as far as how the COVID virus has been contained there compared to here? Yeah. I, in I, other I, words, I uh, you know, yeah. people could travel to Florida and bring it back. And that's a real concern I have. Um, that we don't have the, we're, we can't can be compared to Europe completely because our situation is totally different as a nation. Would you agree with that? I, yeah, I certainly would agree with most of what you said. Um, I do think though that if you, if you have kids that are sitting six feet apart uh, with masks on, um, you know, whether you're in Florida or Pennsylvania or, you know, the, the idea of spreading in that classroom should be the same. Yes, I agree with you totally that you may be introducing more virus to that school if you're in a high prevalent situation. There's no question about it. And we are lucky, uh, and I say lucky in quotes, but we did have our spike earlier and we're, we're, we're one of the states that hasn't had a big uptick. Uh, and so, so you're right, we do have a different prevalence than, than other states do. But the, the overall idea behind keeping people apart and masking in a school situation should be successful 
um, you know, hopefully regardless of what the, the prevalence is. So I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. It's, it's the, the techniques that we're doing, you know, if you, have, if you have a student that comes to school who may just have a runny nose, they shouldn't be in school anyway, but if they are in school, the runny nose, if they're all wearing masks and they're sanitizing their hands and they're remaining apart from their students, we shouldn't see spread. So I, I totally understand what you're saying, but Europe, you know, they did. You know, they did have cases in Europe. Um, it, I can't, obviously, the United States is the worst country in the world right now. There's no question about it you know, from numbers of cases. But, um, you know, countries were able to continue to open, you know, whether it's Sweden or other countries that did have cases. Uh, and they were, they were able to keep their schools open, utilizing some of these same techniques. Um, and and um, so I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I'm, I'm not saying that we're the same as Europe. Of course not. But some of the same techniques that we're, we're starting off pretty strict with good social distancing, full masking. Uh, and as I said earlier, that we're hoping that over time, um, we'll be able to see the effects of that and, and hopefully be able to reduce those things. But I'm definitely not saying that we're the same as, as, as Denmark today, of course. But we do see the trends in those countries that as the cases go down, and the, the cases in, in, in our state have gone down, and we're hoping that Florida, Arizona, California, they are, their peak is already starting to you know, level off and, and, and plateau. And hopefully they'll all be doing what we're doing here and, and, and the governors there will all require universal masking if they haven't already, they have in some states, uh, and get it back down to sort of where we are now so they'll feel comfortable going back with some of the same guidance that we're using here. So masking is really important, isn't it? Because I've Absolutely. been receiving emails from members of this community uh, because I made uh, comments about masking um, a couple weeks ago at a board meeting, and I've received some pretty nasty emails from people um, who are anti-maskers, frankly. Um, and we know where they get that from. Um, and um, I want to hear you say, as the expert, how important masking is and that these kids need to be masked. Um, during school. I, I agree with you. I, I do. I believe that children should be masked. The evidence isn't great in the smallest kids, and we went over that earlier. That's why hopefully maybe a face shield is better for those because, as I said, it's, it is difficult to have a first, second, third grader wear a face mask the entire day that's hot and uncomfortable. That's why one of the reasons we offered the face shields. But I agree with you um, that masking, especially in the older kids, no question about it, that they need to be wearing a mask when they're within six feet at all times. Uh, and I think that for everyone's, you know, it, 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 even, even if someone doesn't believe that a mask is doing everything, is doing anything, from a, from a, I guess from a perspective of someone to say, hey, look, you know, we're doing this to help everyone here, and you, you, we're, we're a team. Uh, and I, I said, I, I don't love wearing a mask eight hours. I don't know anyone who loves wearing a mask eight hours a day. But we do know that when you're talking, sneezing, coughing, and the droplets go into that face shield or that face mask, that helps reduce the spread. Uh, and, and I think that children in school at this point, you know, should be wearing masks or face shield, whatever that whatever that they, they, they choose. And I'm saying it right now, I believe that especially, you know, now that, 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 that we need to see, um, we, we have a level of, of cases that we can do this. I think we can go back to school safely, but that safety now includes masking. You can't Thank tell you. that Jenny's a, an attorney at all, right? Jenny, yeah, you're leading you know, the witness. No, uh, I, I am, but I really wanted the community <laughs> to hear that because I have received personal emails whose names will remain unmentioned um, that have been ridiculously vitriolic and have a very political agenda, frankly, um, about masking. And it's every doctor I've represented or epidemiologist I've talked to in my practice has told me how important masking is. And I wear a mask eight hours a day now at work too. I, I wanted I to bring, whoops, go ahead. Tara. I'm done. Okay, I wanted to bring up one more thing real quick and Wait, then I'm gonna mute. Before you go, I was gonna say before Chris, you already got a chance, one chance. Okay. Let me see if it, <laughs> If we get Let me see if someone, end, I'll ask yes, it. All right. is anybody who hasn't asked Dr. Damsker a question, would they like to ask any questions? Yeah, actually, I had a question. Uh, Dr. Damsker, you were earlier mentioned that, uh, or, or went through a scenario where people shouldn't go over to their friend's house, I think you called him Bob, uh, and, you know, get closer than the six feet. Uh, they should be smart about doing that. It, it increases the risk. But then when Chris asked you about the three, four and a half, and five feet, you were okay with sending kids back into those situations. Can you talk about the, uh, uh, the distinction there? Because that sounds like it's contradicting itself to me. I'm not sure if I understand. Yeah, yeah first of all, you know, in a school structure situation, the kids are wearing masks. We just talked about that, you know, uh, and you're, you're in a structured situation, you're being monitored by teachers, you're being, you know, so 
that that that's a huge difference between you know a friend going to his house and and and, and sitting next to each other and, and if friends aren't asking if kids they don't usually say hey before i come to your house john and play fortnite with you are you sick they, they don't ask each other this question they just go right so i believe that the structured nature of the of the school um, being in a classroom with a teacher enforcing it uh, and, and the kids wearing masks, I think is a different situation than someone going to a party, sitting around, you know, drinking or whatever they're doing, playing games and not paying attention to other people's symptoms, uh, you know, sharing drinks, all the kind of stuff that people can do without masks on. And most times people don't go to each other's house with masks on. They just don't, right? You don't go to your friend's house with masks on. So I think there is, there is a difference. And hopefully that made a little sense. So basically, it, it again comes down to masks. You won't go to your friend's house without a mask, even if you stay six feet apart. But you'll go to school as long as you have the mask on. You're okay. Did I understand it yeah, right? No, man, yeah. If you're asking whether a mask makes a difference, it does. Yes. No. Yeah, I knew that, but that's not. What I was trying to. But I, I, I think I think that to clarify your point, though, Brian, is 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 if you're if you're outside of the six foot. It, you know, theoretically, you probably wouldn't need a mask, right? Theory, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're outside and you're six feet apart, theoretically, you wouldn't need a mask. But you don't you come together. Your 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 spread is higher, and 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 that's right. where the mask barrier comes in on both the the person who's potentially sick and the person who doesn't want to get sick. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure. If, if I didn't answer your question, please ask me. Please ask me again. I, I, no, I, I think you. I think you did. Um, like I said, it just seemed like there was a uh, a contradiction in what you were saying earlier compared to what you said to, in response to Chris's answer, or I'm sorry, to Chris's question. Okay. Well, sorry, clear it up. Okay. Keith, you don't have any questions. Just so you know, by the way. Keith on our board is a nurse practitioner, and um, so I, I, I was, I'm surprised, Keith, that you don't have any questions, but I guess we maybe answered them all. No, and I think you did a great job of really kind of explaining what we know and, and what are practiced in, in the, in daily in, in hospitals, um, and uh, we've seen in our, our, our hospitals as well. I mean, I, I agree with him that the, the numbers in, are, are staggeringly low. Um, on a number of COVID patients we have and, and you know, I scratch my head all the time thinking about, you know, when, when this low level that we see in these intermittent spikes, I think it's probably going to stick around for a while like that, months if not years until we have either a vaccine or, or herd immunity, whichever comes first. Um, and so uh, a 0% case, I mean, we talked about this early on, I don't think we're going to get to that point as a community. Um, and I agree with him 100% that, that you know, I, I feel very comfortable in a mask being taking care of COVID patients every day. Um, it's just part of what we do. Awesome. Thank you for your comment. Any other board members that haven't talked yet before I get back over to Chris? I have one more question too that from the community, but any other board members? I just wanted to thank Dr. Damsker for meeting with us at the high school the other day and uh, taking the time to join us on this meeting and answer these questions. Sure. Yeah, it was really good. Um, there was a comment in there, you know, he hasn't toured our schools or something. And, and I think it was above and beyond that you came out. And it was great for us too, as board members to see what that looks like. And by the way, to the community, I will show you guys some of those pictures so you can get a visual on that. We had a question I feel like is a very important one to address. People are wondering, about special needs students and wearing masks and we know that some of our special needs students won't be able to do that do you have any advice on how we navigate through that yeah there, there there's 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 going to be kids and again every school is a little bit different i mean you know, some of the kids are, are mainstreamed into the classrooms and they're there all day sometimes they're in a separate room for part of the day and, and i can't i don't know exactly how quaker town does it but um yeah there's some kids who won't be able to wear them and the staff who take care of those kids, you know, one to one sometimes. Obviously, I think they have some concerns, um, and I think you can try. You know, there, there there are, and I've spoken to parents that have special needs, kids with special needs, and they have been able to get their kids to wear masks at times. So it's, it may not be all day, it may not be every day, but I do think that we hope that we ask all parents to to make that attempt because some of the children are able to do it, uh, and that that that's the first step. Even if it's not all day, even if it's just for portions of the day, uh, I think that obviously that the aides need to be. To be to be careful 
they need to be wearing, obviously, sometimes, you know, there, there's times where there could be spit involved or other, other actions where they may want to wear a face shield and a mask, depending on above the situation. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, that the, 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 the aides need to be, or that the, the, whatever the, the name, I, I want to say the wrong thing, I apologize, but whoever's taking okay. care of the, the kids with special needs clearly have a, have a higher risk. But as we said earlier, you know, our overall prevalence here is low in the Quaker Town School District. So the chances of one of those children with special needs having coronavirus is, is, is very low. Uh, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that there's no risk involved. Of course there is. But those parents, those, those, uh, the teachers and the staff that deal with those children should be uh, extremely careful with the PPE that they're wearing uh, and, and, and maintain that at all times. Uh, and it's not an easy job. Uh, I, I have deep respect for those that, that work with those children. I know it can be difficult. It can be, uh, but I know it's rewarding and that's why they do it. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've gotten questions from school nurses about, you know, nebulizers and all kinds of and inhalers and things. And we've tried to address those, you know, through uh, the, the uh, school health nurse coordinators as they've come up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that. All right, Chris, back over to you. Okay. So now, now comes my um, sort of wrapping up question that if, if we do, we're going to have this discussion now at whether we're comfortable sending our students back with our desks spread apart four to five feet up to six feet in um, for the five day returning students. Um, our option is if, if say we get too much pressure from the teachers or we get too much pressure from uncomfortable parents going below that six foot threshold, you know, even only to four and a half or five feet, the option for us is to go to a forced a b schedule where the kids will go to school two days a week and then they'll have the other three days a week off and then the next group will go two days a week and have the other three days off plus the weekend so my, my question and i sort of talked to you about this outside of this meeting but could there be or is there do you think more danger in having the kids outside of school for that long than there is to having them in school, but spaced less than six feet, like say four and a half or five feet. Yeah, I think that, you know, the hybrid model, obviously there's, there's pros and cons to every one of the models. But what I can tell you is the hybrid model is the teacher is still gonna be exposed to the same children every week. If the children are there Monday, Tuesday versus Monday through Friday, and the kids that are there Thursday and Friday versus the whole week, the same numbers of children are still going to be in those classrooms. So if a child's parents infect them and the child comes to school with COVID because their parents went to Florida, that child's still going to be in school. Um, and so it doesn't really decrease the, the, the effect of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the idea that we, we can keep COVID out of our schools using the hybrid model. Uh, and I won't get into the, the logistics of it because I know that's a school thing, but I know the logistics of a hybrid model can be difficult, um, they're all, but they all have pros and cons. I think it's important though that you know, wearing a mask at four and a half feet uh, is still a very effective way of, of, of stopping spread. Uh, and, and saying that, you know, wearing a mask at six feet won't have any spread, it, it's not true either. There's no number of feet where you can say, other than me and you being in the same Zoom call, we, you and I will not transmit any disease, hopefully, uh, at this rate. You know, uh, four and a half to five feet versus six feet, um, it, it's a very minor difference. And that, that study the Lancet showed that, that once you get to that, that three foot, has a big risk, of, a big reduction of risk in, 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 um, in transmission risk. And then it gets a little bit better as you, each meter goes out. But, but the idea though that you're, you, the, whether you're five feet or six feet and wearing masks all day, um, I don't believe that, that there's much of a difference uh, in risk of spreading between children and children that are wearing masks. Uh, and, and I know, uh, again, keeping kids out of school two days a week versus you know, the five days, those kids are still gonna be in that school regardless of whether it's two days or five days. So if a kid has COVID from home, they're still coming to school. Uh, and it doesn't really have much of an impact on that at all. So, um, you know, the six feet versus five feet, it's very difficult to say if there's, if there's any you know, minor or, or small difference in, in the infection risk difference. Well, it's the amount of time they're outside of the school then too that will be increased. So wouldn't they potentially be bringing in more potential virus because they'll have more time to go over to their friend's house and play Fortnite or, you know, go to the park and share a vape or, you know, whatever kids do that puts them in danger these days. I agree a hundred percent, you know, being inside of a school in a structured environment, um, you know, the, the, you know what they're doing, you know where they are, they're being monitored all day. 
Uh, and if three days a week, you know, again, every model is different. There may be models where you are forced to be watching your TV, you know, the, the, the screen of a live presentation of whatever the teacher is doing. So that's, those children may be required, but um, they, are, they may be unmonitored at home. They may have two working parents that aren't seeing what the kids are doing. And you're right, they could be doing other things at, at higher risk behavior. So, um, you know, th there is no really, there's no evidence. And there's some modeling that shows that having, you know, that there was a big model that I think that at the, I think the state of Pennsylvania commission that talked about hybrid models, but, but this has never really been done before. Um, and, and I believe that there's definitely some disadvantages of the hybrid model versus the in-person model, but every, every, everything has its pros and cons. And obviously you guys have to talk through those, but you know, from a perspective of keeping COVID out of schools, um, those same kids are coming into school, whether it's two days or five days. Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry, but doesn't that mean though that if there's if we're using the AB model, wouldn't that limit the number of people in the classroom at any one time, which would then limit the risk to those people? Uh, and then ideally, we're supposed to be cleaning the rooms after every day, so the people that are coming in would would have an even less risk. Is, is, am I under, misunderstanding that? No, no, I'm saying that. No, I understand what you're saying about people and, and more exposure outside, but. If they're coming into the school on an AB schedule, then there's only 15 people in the classroom as opposed to, let's say, 22, 25, or even less. Maybe there's 12 in the classroom, whatever it might be. Uh, so now they're only risking those 12 uh, to whatever potential exposure they might have, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, a full day where, where there might be more students in the classroom and they would be exposing more. That, that seems to me to be the benefit of the AB model. I agree with you, the AB model is terrible on so many levels uh, and things like that, but it does seem to have some benefits to me and I'm not sure where that comes in. Well, I would say that, yeah, if you have a room with five people you know, versus a room with 25 people, obviously there's, that cohort is smaller. Um, so if, if one of those kids got the other four sick, you know, you would have a it's easier to quarantine five versus 25. I understand that, that model, but, but what we're saying is though that if everyone is at five feet and they're wearing masks and they're doing a good job, the, 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 the small risk benefit difference between five feet and six feet uh, in, a, in a classroom uh, is probably, you know, again, uh, this is up to you guys to consider the, risk, the, the, the risks and the, pro, and the pros and cons, but the benefit of that uh, is probably, you know, it's probably minor at best. And I can't say that every time you're further apart, you know, if you're six feet, you have less risk of spreading it than when you are when you're, you're someone face to face. And if you're 12 feet, there's less risk of exposing someone than you are six feet. But the, the incremental risk, you know, gets smaller and smaller as you go further apart. All right, let's, uh, Dr. Damsker, we're going to get one more question from uh, another board member, Ron Jackson. Sir, would you like to ask a question? Dr. Damsker, um, up here, I think we've laid out pretty clearly that we're one of the outliers and we don't have a lot of cases out here in, in Quakertown area. Um, I think we've done a good job of showing what the risks are and that I think we're properly mitigating them. But some of the other school districts in the area are actually starting virtual and then going to take it a little, you know, a wait and see approach. Is there any benefit to that? Because I'm trying to figure out why they would waste their time. That's just my opinion. Why bother? Is there any benefit to that? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, they, they've decided that they, uh, you know, it, it could be for multiple reasons. It could be because they, they have trouble fitting the kids in, you know, whatever the spacing is in individual schools. There's some schools that just have, they literally can't even do three feet really in some of the schools. And, and they've made the decision that for now, they're going to see how it goes with the virtual or hybrid model because it helps with the spacing. Um, some, you know, most of the school districts, uh, I believe there's only one in Bucks County that's opened up with a full virtual for the first couple of weeks. I believe that's Council Rock. Um, and they're going to move to a virtual or a hybrid choice, you know, as they go. Uh, but they've made the decision, their board made the decision that they don't, that they want to see how it goes in Quakertown or in the other school districts that have voted to have a full in-person model. Uh, you know, Central Bucks has the full in-person model for the elementary school. Um, and that's the decision they've made. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a believer. I wouldn't be sitting here telling you uh, that I thought it was unsafe, or I wouldn't be sitting here telling you that. And I believe that you can make the decision, uh, and, and the masking really does make a difference. I know that, I, I, and I apologize, the board member who asked me about the masking, um, I didn't, I forgot her name, I apologize. Jenny. Oh, yeah, and, and, and you know, I obviously, 
you know, I'm saying on this conference call that I believe masking works and that, that that's a huge part of this. And, um, you know, that I'm not sure why, you know, other than watching school districts across the country, you know, the, the, you know Philadelphia just changed their model. Uh, and I'm not, I can't really tell you why. They went from a hybrid model to a virtual model. Uh, and there's some other school districts across the country that decided to do that. And part of that is because some of them have a higher prevalence. Part of them, some of it's because the school districts um, you know, just didn't feel comfortable. They, they, they're, they're, they're um, spending a lot of time. Like I said, I don't, I don't watch CNN. I said this before. My data that I get is from Bucks County. We have, you know, 6,400 cases now. We, tra we contact trace 96 to 90 percent, 97 percent. We can't get them all because they don't call us back. We have really good data here in Bucks County. We know what's going on. We know how the transmission is working, um, and uh, you know, we feel comfortable making these recommendations. And, uh, you know, and I think that, that I, I'm sitting here to you today telling you that this is what I believe based on my experience and based on what we've, we've, we've worked really hard. My, I'm so proud of the staff at the Bus County Health Department, uh, all the work that's been done, you know, since the, since the end of February. And, um, you know, we believe that with the masking and the distancing and the sanitizing and all the policies, you guys have a long, um, you know, the, the, the entire matrix of the, your health and safety plan has a lot of things in there. And if you go back to what we were doing in March, we weren't doing any of that or very little of that. And so going back to school is gonna look a lot different in a couple of weeks or a month, whatever it is. Uh, I think you guys are going back in September. In, in, in that time period, it's gonna look a lot different than it did in March when we closed schools. Uh, I think it's gonna be a lot safer. And I think that there's a lot of things that we're putting into place that it's a different environment. And so I agree, there was a question earlier you asked me about, is it different for the kids? Sure, it's gonna be different. But I think our kids are willing to do that to get back to the social and all and the, all the educational and and and, and um, emotional advantages that they get from from being in school. So um, that's kind of my take on it. And it's temporary that we have to keep our eyes on the fact that it is temporary and hope that it ends sooner than later. And Dr. if they don't want to go back, they can go virtual. One hundred. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and and just to mention, I, I do think that we have to get used to this virus a little bit. I hate to say that. I don't mean that in any kind of way. I'm not, I'm not being, um, you know, saying it's not a, a bad, but it, it's, it's, it's a real virus. It's out there. But my concern though is that this virus could be with us for an extended period of time. And, you know, we talked about having a vaccine. The vaccine may, may or may not work. It may or may not be available in the sufficient quantities to, because to, our children are probably not going to be the first kids to get the vaccine. They're going to focus on, on the long-term care facilities. That's the highest death rate. So, you know, it may be a long time before there's enough vaccine produced. So I believe that we need to say, you know, the situation right now as we have it, we, we could be having, we could be plateauing this number of cases for a year. And we believe that it's a safe way to bring the kids back. If you follow the guidelines, if we do all those things, if we decide to go virtual now, uh, there's some of these school districts may never be able to bring their kids back. The situation gets just a little bit worse. And I think it's really important that we understand, uh, and I've had to ask time that, that this is this could be a long-term situation, and we are lucky here that in Quaker Town and in Pennsylvania, Bucks County, that we have the prevalence rate to be able to do this safely. And, and I say that, and I believe we can. Dr. Damsker, we are truly appreciative that you took out your t time in your busy day. I know, just from talking to you, that you're working super long hours. You have really dedicated yourself to the health and wellness of our county. So thank you so much for taking out the time. You've given us a lot to think about. You've answered some really tough questions. So I appreciate your patience as we've asked them. I appreciate all the information. Um, and with that, we won't keep you any longer. So um, unless you have any final remarks, uh, then you can go enjoy the rest of your evening. And we appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Listen, I do. Thank you. Thank you guys all for having thank me. I appreciate it. Best of luck in your decision making and thank best you. of luck to the Waver Town School District. Thank you. And thanks to all the teachers and the parents and the staff. I know this is tough for everybody. I do. Uh, but I think we can do it safely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. All right. I was going to tell him to run before Chris asked his next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I do want to show people um, some of these pictures. So bear with me here. You guys can see my screen, right? You guys can see it? Yeah, that's working. 
Uh, so <laughs> I guess I guess we had to hold Chris back a few years. Oh my goodness. Yes, we did. So as you can see, so this is six foot distancing. And, and as you can see, like I, we all know that more distance is better. That That is clear. So this is just to give you an idea. I was actually pretty shocked by the, how much of spacing it looked like with six feet. Um, but it, we're gonna have a couple more pictures in here. So now this was the three feet. This is where, you know, I didn't feel comfortable with that at all. You could tell just from the difference, it's such, it's staggering. So that where I have it circled there, that was three foot of distance. And, and I think we all agreed, no, that, that just, that looks really tight. It looks tighter than it would be in a normal classroom. This was our four and a half foot distancing. Why does my picture seem off here? Hold on, sorry guys. Why does it seem a bit off? Okay, let's see if that's better. All right, so this was four and a half foot distancing. That gives you a little bit of an idea of how, how that looks. I'm gonna need some help on this one, Rob. Do you know if I can't, I, and Chris said, and I apologize ahead of time, this, I believe this was five foot of distance. No, this was the six when we first went in. At, okay. Yeah, at five, I think we had almost all the desks in there. This yeah, is, um, okay. This is so, Dr. Mr. Wien's room. Yeah, so we felt pretty com comfortable. I can tell you guys, we were able to fit, um, and, and Chris or Dave, you know, or Dr. Horner, you guys can correct me here. Um, but I, I feel like we were able to fit a, a full classroom at four and a half feet. So what that tells me based on the registrations and, and we'll hopefully get an update on that tonight, if we can fit every like 24 kids in a classroom at four and a half feet, knowing that we're gonna have people who are gonna sign up for full virtual for hybrid, I feel pretty comfortable depending on what the numbers come out that we, we're gonna be able to get a lot closer to, to that six foot distancing. You guys agree with that based on your observation? I do. I mean, w if we were in the high school, we had those desks, the full classroom of 23 desks there was in that first classroom we were in at five feet. Mm -hmm. And that was 23 desks at five feet. The room was a little bit bigger in there. And that was the full class from last year. So if, if you take 20% of those students out or 15% or of those students out even, we, you know, that should give us the six feet that we needed. Now, I understand that, you know, just going off of percentages that sign up for virtual isn't necessarily going to equally take that many kids out of every classroom across the district that, you know, some, there may not be many kids that were taking uh, AP calculus or whatever class that want to go to uh, a hybrid or virtual. So we may not have, it may not be as balanced as, as we would like, but I think we could make it work to get all of the kids that need to and want to get back the opportunity to get back. Yeah. And so my comment, cause I did have a lot of, you know, my friends who are teachers reach out to me and say, Oh, such and such is going virtual to start. Um, I do believe just my personal opinion, they're just delaying the inevitable. I think they eventually all want to go back to some kind of in-person classrooms and maybe they do want to wait and see. Luckily being where we are, I can tell you, I know schools in Alabama are starting up next week. So we will also get some time to see how school reopening goes because we have schools that are starting a little bit sooner than us. But these other ones that are like that, you also have to consider, especially more low income school districts, those schools have a very large number of kids in a classroom. And so they may not be able to have the distancing that's, that's needed in those classrooms. You know, we just don't know. Um, and the, I was just going to say the, yeah. the key. The key for me is that they're going to be on top of the number of cases, and you know, it's we, we can guess all we want about the effectiveness, but we have multi layers of risk mitigation and monitoring. You know, contact tracing. They're look. They're going to be looking out. You know, so as long as you know we we get close contact with that kind of data, you know, we'll we'll be at least aware of things and be able to take action, um, you know, and, and prevent anything from spreading. So that's, to me, that's the best of all, all worlds. You I think we have, have over 35,000 people in, in our district. Is that right, Dr. Horner? 
in total. I think I looked it up. It was something like 30, 33,000, um, 33,000 and change. So we have 25 cases. And again, we have to keep our eye on that if it changes, but that's literally 0.001% case infection in our community spread or not community spread in our community in general. That's mostly adults. Yeah. I think it goes back to one fundamental point. That this is not going away. <laughs> this is this is going to be around for a while. Dr. Demsker said he suspects it. A lot of the experts I talk to suspect it. There is a new norm that has to develop. And that new norm has to be with the focus of, of us trying to get back to some normalcy for, for our, our kids. And one of the things I can't wait until the first testing comes out to look at our data, um, because I'm convinced that, that the kids didn't learn well the last three months of school. I'm convinced of it. And uh, I, I, I want to see our data. Maybe they'll, it'll prove me wrong. And maybe my hypothesis is completely wrong. Um, but I'm not convinced that, that, that the students got the education they need. And I, and I, I feel bad that people are choosing the virtual route. I feel bad for Philadelphia where we know that one in two kids didn't sign even in one time. 50% of their kids didn't sign in virtually one time in three months. Um, these are vulnerable populations to begin with. And, and then for them not to get the education, geez, are they getting fed? Are they, I mean, you know, it's just, it, it, it makes you really, really concerned for the future. If we just keep continuing with like this laissez-faire, uh, attitude. I think you can do it. I think you can protect yourself. We do it every day. I'm around COVID patients all the time. My staff is around COVID patients all the time. They wear masks. They clean their hands. They don't touch their eyes. They're fine. Yeah, I, I, I want to I want to jump on and you know shout out to Keith for that statement because we cannot continue to live in a hole anymore. You know we cannot continue to put our lives, not just schooling, but so many other things on hold because of this, this issue. Um, it's time to get back to living our lives again, but taking those extra steps of precaution that we need to take. We've got all the information we need, I think. We know what the safety precautions are that we should take. We know who the vulnerable people for the most part are and we can take extra steps and extra precautions when we're around them. But for the rest of us, we need to get back to life as normal as possible. We, we got to get moving again in schooling. Getting our kids back in school is an important part of that. And, and I agree, but the, the, my point has always been, if there is an extra step that we can take that increases the likelihood that people are going to be uh, healthier and safer, then I think we as a board are responsible to do that. Uh, and if that means setting up six feet as the model, uh, just even though there's only a, a limited uh, benefit to it, that benefit is still there. I'm concerned about this new normal and what the kids are going back to. You know, we've talked a little bit about, and Dr. Damsker talked a little bit about what that new normal would look like and, and kids are resilient and they are. But if, you have kindergartners or, or younger kids who are going into a school and it's so drastically different. They can't interact. They can't, they have to wear masks. It's a scary thing as it is. Now you're adding all of these other things onto it. I think that new normal uh, that we're talking about putting them back into uh, is just as scary as the situation we're in right now. So, you know, we talked about the benefits of mental health, but, we have to provide for the benefits of physical health before we can really solidify the benefits of the mental health. You know, it just goes back to some, some of the basic principles of uh, Maslow and, and things like that. Um, well, that's to my point, Brian. My point is that some of these kids aren't even getting the basic food. If you're yeah. going to go to Maslow's, food is a fundamental basis. Absolutely. Kids don't eat sometimes if they're not in the school, school systems getting fed. And so that worries me. And it, right. and no, it, it worries me too. Worry and mental health should worry you as much as physical health, even if, if not more, because the numbers would support, we can't use science one way and then not agree with it. The science would support that these kids aren't getting it. 
the science I, would support I, that I, the youngest kids aren't aren't getting it. No, I understand that, but we, we I think what we need to do is is do things additionally. Look, I'm not saying we shouldn't have kids back in school. I voted for this plan, and I think we should have an option for kids to go back to school. But I think we need to do everything within our power to do it safely and create the safest environment. And if that means sticking to our uh, to the plan where we, we start with six feet and say, this is how many students are going to be able to be in a classroom, for example, then that's what I think we need to do. So you know, let I me think, well, I what you're saying about, you know, kids with, uh, you know, food issues and, and not being able to get food, but that's, that's something we need to address outside of the school as well. So let me, let me interject if I could, Brian. I was listening and I encourage everyone to go and listen to um, Dr. Redfield, who is the CDC doctor. He's the head of the CDC. He just did an interview with the Bucks Institute and he specifically says, I'm reading it. So I do think wearing a mask, washing your hands, maintaining social distancing, but the biggest thing about social distancing is the mask. So I don't want people to get hung up on six feet. If we're wearing a mask, these masks really work. These face coverings, simple face coverings, coverings, excuse me, really do work in interrupting the transmission. And I think the public is getting um, used to that. So I think that the CDC is, you know, this this gentleman in particular, who he says it, it he has 11 grandchildren, including one who has cystic fibrosis, and he is saying that his guidance is not meant. Um, so here we go. I just want to read through this. Um, the question was, the CDC put out guidance for school opening. There are school districts that are saying they're going to stay online and they're not opening. Other schools are doing hybrid. Um, the New York Times article based on internal CDC documents warned that fully opening schools and universities would present the highest risk of infection. What is the risk of opening schools? Again, this is Ms. Dr. Redfield. He's answering. He said, yeah, I think it's important, particularly as you look at the CDC documents that you refer to. One of the things that we have tried to do is inform people of minimal risk, mild risk, et cetera. So for example, the risk was, or minimal risk is just everybody stayed at home, period. And so obviously if we go to opening schools five days a week, that's going to be a hierarchical, hierarch, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say, risk. Okay, it's not to imply that the risk is a prohibitive risk. It's just for people to understand and make their own risk assessment. I think it's important and local school districts are going to have to make these decisions. I've said that our guidance that we put out from the CDC, the purpose is to facilitate the reopening of schools. I happen to balance the risk here. It's not the risk of school openings. This is important. It's not the risk of school openings versus public health. It's public health versus public health. And I'm of the point of view, and I weigh that equation as an individual that has 11 grandchildren, that the greater risk is actually to the nation to keep these schools closed. You know, a lot of kids get their mental health services, 7 million in school. A lot of people get food and nutrition in schools. Schools are important in terms of mandatory reporting sexual and child abuse. Obviously, the socialization is important. And obviously, for some kids, I think the majority of kids, their learning in a face-to-face -face school is the most effective method of teaching. That said, it should be done safely, and it has to be with the confidence of teachers. It has to be with the confidence of parents. So I think the reason I'm reading that, guys, is because I keep hearing people using the CDC as a guidance to not get our kids back into schools. And it's clear from what he's saying that we, uh, we, we, we can't, six feet is great if that's the goal. That's what we're going to try to get to, right? And that's but, not what we're saying. We're, we're not saying we're trying to keep kids out of school. We're trying to use the CDC guidance in order to get them into school safely. There's a difference there. And, and I think- but From the person that's doing the contact tracing, that's why I asked the question I asked specifically at the end, is because I said, in your opinion, what is more dangerous? What poses more risk to the teachers in those classrooms? Having an AB model or only sending, you know, or sending the kids back five days at five feet instead of six feet. And he clearly said that the risk of five feet to six feet is minimal, 
but the the same exposure if not more would come upon those teachers by having the kids outside of the school for the other three days a week Chris, i don't mean to to disagree and i, I really i appreciate dr damster coming in and i i respect the heck out of him but this is a guy who wrote in a letter about two months ago that kids could be in a classroom three feet apart and they didn't have to wear masks so so i find his uh guidance i'm skeptical of his guidance that is how a lot of european schools open they, they some some did it completely without social distancing without masks so yeah there, there is precedent so we're yeah, taking, they also extra, have fewer cases. taking extra precautions I, I is there I, something else brian that you think we need to be doing no i i think that we need to do everything that is in our power you know so i'm, I'm going to use social distance just as the example but you know, if six feet is what the strictest recommendation is, then we need to set up the rooms, let's say, at six feet and say that's the number of students that can fit in this room. Despite the fact that the, the guidance from the doctor is clearly despite, saying. Despite the fact, because as I just said to Chris, I don't know that I trust his guidance. I'm talking this, about the CDC, the head of the CDC is what I just read. He said, don't get hung up on the six foot distance, wear a mask, right? I'm not getting hung up on the six foot distance. I use that as an example. You are. You are. I'm not. Yeah, you are. I'm, no, I'm yeah. not. Anyway, let's move on. I, so I, I think the bottom line is this. I think that you, you, you have to take the science of this disease and say what we did on March 15th is completely different than what we're doing at the end of July. And it's been clear, the evolution, I've seen the evolution, I've, I've read it, I've lived it. And so I, I disagree with your statement from somebody who made a comment two months ago uh, and maybe changing it. And I disagree with the news media that does the same thing. And the people that say, you know, when, when, when scientists change the way that they approach things uh, based on either new research or new literature that they're reading or the more they find out about something, stuff changes. That's what we deal with daily. And so I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, gotta, I gotta believe, it. one of the things that I've been steadfast is saying that we know social distancing works, we know masks work, and we know clean your hands work. We've known that about viruses forever, forever. We're having this conversation today because of COVID. What we should have been doing is having it about influenza and common, you know, the common cold and parainfluenza and all the rest of the viruses that we deal with as a country every day. So what would we need to do for Dr. Harner and Nancy Ann and the task force to, to help them with guidance on how we want to move forward? I mean, our plan doesn't really necessarily have to change. I mean, we were already saying we, we would go with the three foot of minimum spacing and we would keep the mask wearing even beyond six foot, correct, Dr. Harner? Do we need to really change much or? No. Not, not a thing. I don't think we need to either because we said yeah. six foot when feasible. That's going to be the goal. Um, I think when we get numbers back, we'll be able to see what, how that shakes out. And, you know, if we can make it work, if we can, if it's possible for us to do, but I feel like that um, our plan offers some, that flexibility. And do we have numbers yet, Dr. Harner? Oh yeah, Dr. Harner, do you have you guys want to share that at all? Uh, Ms. Edwards, would you please give them a brief overview of what we know as of today, um, as of to, uh, this evening, I think. She's there, I know she is. We'll give good, her a second. Good response, Ray. Trying to unmute. Okay. Okay, now wait, I wrote all that down and I put it over here. All right, as of um, this afternoon, we had received 3,700 responses um, or registrations and that's students, not families because each individual student got a SNAP code. So we have heard from about 75% of our of our students so far, which is good. The, the uh, deadline was tonight. We did get questions about could people wait to hear tonight's discussion before submitting their registration? We said yes. Um, 
Principals and secretaries have been sending out reminders to families to register, and as we get the number smaller, they will start calling um, people individually to try to make sure that we've accounted for every student. Um, so far, we are, um, the percentages, and this varies by grade level, and it varies by, by building, um, but overall, about 60% are choosing live instruction, 21.8% are selecting hybrid, and 17.1% are selecting virtual. So um, it's similar, not that different from the, the survey um, information, which is good. Um, what principals are doing is calculating the exact capacity of every one of their uh, classrooms based on a similar process that uh, Mrs. Mitchell and Mr. Spear, Mr. Rachmanowitz, that they were kind of doing as an exercise on, uh, uh, I guess, earlier this week. Um, but that's what principals are doing uh, with their custodians and such for every room in their building so they know the capacity. And then they'll be looking at the number of students in the grade level that selected live instruction, and they'll be seeing how they can use the spaces in their building with the appropriate social distancing to accommodate the number of students per grade level that, um, that have requested that. So that's, the, that's what they are engaged in, um, and hopefully on August 13th, we'll have a, a full report of what we what we can do, what we can't do, what we can do, but what the consequences will be in terms of um, the student experience and such. So that's what we as of today. May, may I ask you to, um, what were those percentages again? 60% requested live instruction. Was it 29% hybrid? 21.8%. 21.8, 21 17.1 virtual. All right, that, that's why my numbers didn't add up, thank you. Dr. Harder, can you recall, isn't that approximately the spread we were looking for if we wanted to give everybody their choice? In other words, can't we get 60% live with 20% the other two options, which is approximately what we have? Is that, a, is that not accurate or? I would not want to say tonight. That was what I recall, Ron. Okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. I, I'm not. I don't want to put you on the spot. That's, that's but, but we. I was put on the spot when I said that before, and I want to make sure that, that my answers are accurate tonight. So, and, and and we don't have that yet. Yeah, what Nancy Ann just described will get us the real number. So, we, we can still wait. Don't know. AP Music. Do, do we know uh, what's the time though, so. for the other people to uh, to uh, reply? Well. We have to schedule every student, so deadline is sort of a, um, that's the, we would like people to do it right away, but we will have to track families down one at a time and, and account for the students that are missing. Right. Do we know if there, when will we get an idea of by grade level? You know, for instance, did we have more interest in a certain area by a certain grade, that type of thing? Well, the pattern so far is that there are certain grade levels that where there is a higher interest in live instruction than others. And those tend to be the transitional years, like sixth grade, uh, ninth grade, senior year, um, and to some extent in the primary grades. But we will have all that for you once we have all the numbers and the principals have done their analysis for their own facility, because remember this is a classroom by classroom exercise, so the global number only, only tells us so much. Okay, that's fair. Thank you for that update, I really appreciate it. If you haven't registered, register please. Faster we get that done, the faster we can start to, to really get a good picture and make plans. I will say 17% hybrid or, or virtual rather, 17% virtual. It's much higher than I ever would have predicted. I know it's not final yet, but. Well, Ron, where you at, Ron? What did I, I just want to tell you, Ron, I told you so. I didn't think we'd get anybody wanting AB. I <laughs> told you so. You go live, why would you go AB? If you want to go AB, why would you go live? I don't, I don't know. Hey, it's one, not one of the. One of the points that uh, Mr. Spears asked me questions or had comments for 
for months about it, about cyber school. And it, I asked the principals today of um, how many requests for records. And there are very low numbers. We're talking close to somewhere, right? Or maybe a little bit over 10, 10 families have, parents have asked for 10 students um, for, for uh, cyber charter schools. I did have one additional question while you're unmuted, Dr. Harner. So at, I know you don't like to get locked in and I'm just saying like theoretically, has the task force discussed at all having some dedicated virtual teachers? And if we are at 60% or I mean 21.8% hybrid and 17% virtual, would that give us maybe some options to have some, some of the at-risk teachers be able to teach completely virtual? That's and a good question. It's a great question, and we've talked about that during the FAQs in the FAQs and the other night uh, in both of those uh, meetings in the town hall meetings. Uh, if we have a teacher just teaching virtual, and we have an outbreak, who is going to be teaching the students? So our model is that the teachers that have the students at home in an asynchronous um maybe sometimes live in the morning meeting or something like that will be the same teachers that are in the classroom so the students can going back and forth um if they're sick because we expect a lot of students will be staying at home our attendance is going to be not like it's been at 95 percent um it, it's going to be lower because we're going to have issues and so the model that we have going forward is uh, with the teachers, no dedicated teachers to teaching uh, virtual, none. Yeah, I'm sure that that presents. That is a challenge. It's a challenge. It, and I, I, and you guys are you're doing your best. I mean, this is so difficult to navigate. Um, it's it's challenging no matter which way you go. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, we we're picking from two options that are the greatest options. So I did want to just mention before we move on that I've been hearing a lot from, and I know that you guys have something coming out soon, but I've been hearing a lot from teachers that are stressed about how am I going to complete these three options? How am I going to manage, you know, all of this? And so what I think is really important for us to do as a district and you guys are about to put something more out on this is to to really help our teachers know that we're going to support them through that and what exactly that's going to look like so um hopefully we get m more details on that soon well, one of the things is we've got a very robust professional development opportunity in august um a lot of parents have asked the question why do we have a, a shortened class day um, over the standard class day, and it's because of time. Teachers need to have time to be able to work with students in all the different environments that they have, um, in the classroom environment, the home environment, so two, the two different environments, and we're providing them that time to do that. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have the time um, to, for them, and we, we sh shouldn't have the expectation but we're providing them time every day, 180 days out of the school year to do it. Do you think that we'll see more support from the district office in terms of, um, I guess what I'm thinking is if I'm a teacher, I, I wanna know, am I gonna be 100% responsible for the virtual um, stuff or is it going to be, cause I know it's gonna be both synchronous and asynchronous. So are we gonna have some support from the district um, administration in terms of helping them through that? Are they gonna expect to do that individually on their own as class? Or are they gonna sort of spread it out within each other? That's, that's kind of the, some of the things I'm just curious the, about. As I shared already, the support out of uh, the Office of Teaching and Learning and pro with professional development of our, our coaches, um, Chad Evans, uh, Aaron Oletzka, and uh, Dr. Hoffman. They've got an incredible program laid on for, for uh, August, September, and, and during the school year. That's, again, that's, we've got time. That's why in our model in the, in the springtime was because some of the folks that, that should have been working in Canvas um, it, uh, I'm talking about the teachers working in Canvas before and have their model up. We provided that time back in April and uh, early April to get them caught up to where they should have been. And so it's been, it's, 
the uh, every Friday in the in April and May was a professional development day for all of this. So I feel very comfortable that teachers know how to use their learning management platforms. Um, it, teachers across first grade need to be talking to each other. Teachers across second grade, as I've talked to to Ryan, um, our um, our president of our of our teachers association. Um, he teaches the uh, math and science at the fifth grade level. We have 15 to 16 teachers per grade um, in, in our elementary schools. So there's about uh, five or seven or eight teachers um, teaching math because they're all compartmentalized. Those eight teachers uh, can break, it, break easily break down the year in Cecil, have all their lessons in there. So if they're, um, if, if we have a substitute, we're going to have a we're going to have a, a teacher problem this year. We're going to have a substitute problem this year. That, and, and already, um, I, I, I can't speak for all the other areas, but I know one of our districts in, in, um, in, the, in the county um, that's very similar in size to us and, and number of teachers and all that, already 40 teachers have applied for family emergency leave and um, under the Free uh, Family Cares Act. 15 of them are special ed. Wait, you mean we're not in our district? Not in our district, in our county already. Okay, we've only county. we we've only had two so far, um, which is awesome because the teachers were a part. Our union leadership was uh, participants in developing our health and safety plan. So I I firmly believe if we stick with our health and safety plan, the me the measurements in in our classes that we talked about back in June and early July that that our teachers are going to stay with us, but but in other districts, they're already going out. 15% of one district is all, uh, of their teachers have already said they're not, they're not coming back until um, I think I think the date is that December 31st when the Family Cares Act um, um, uh, is over. So, so that, that period is over. To that point, and I think you bring up a, a really valid point um, with and I and I've heard this discussed in the past with subs not being available and. And you know the worry about what happens if somebody needs to be quarantined. Is there anything from a board level that, that we should be dealing with, or administrative level that, that the board can act on? In other words, should we think about uh, a year bringing on some more assistance internally and not relying on external? My understanding is we we use a company for for. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, for for our substitutes, yes, yeah. sir. E ESS, I think, is their acronym for. Um, they used to call the Source for Teachers was their previous name. They've changed their name. But the, the big thing that that I was going to start communicating out to our families, because some of our families of uh, people who are have been either unemployed or whatever the situation, parents are at home. If they have a, uh, if they could be would become substitutes for us. Um, is also, there anything, should we hire our own internal? So we have. Like, well, the, well the, the other the other conversation I had uh, was it today or yesterday with our our uh, president of our support staff is to, to, I encourage Jan Detweiler and she's probably on the call here that, and hopefully she's followed through with it is to put out a message to her members and we'll we'll do it ourselves through HR is if the our our aides who are um, have a bachelor's degree. And getting them emergency certified. So if teachers are out, we have uh, someone with that emergency certificate ready to step into the classroom. We already have a substitute problem. It's a it's a constant problem that the, that Ryan Wynn, our association president, talks to us every year about. And and we've talked to you. You know about that. Um, and because we talk about teachers and during the school day, they're uh, we don't have enough subs. We a teacher giving up their planning period. So they're not as well prepared for their next class or teaching. And, and, and I think our situation is going to be um, much worse this year. Yeah, so I have, to that end, I was thinking, is there, is there a way, can, as a board, can we approve something that, that gives a, you know, a full pool of, of five people that we would pay every day for the entire year, and then we would rotate them as needed to augment? Well, well, I, to, I don't know, just spitballing ideas here. One of the things is that we've talked at the cabinet level. I've talked with uh, other administrators, with principals, elementary principals, middle school principals, our instructional coaches. Um, 
you know, this is not an unusual uh, year. You looked in our FAQs, there, it's written all over there. Um, there's a lot of things we have to do that's different and hopefully for a short period of time. And one of them, we have the, the math coaches and the, uh, and the reading coaches we have in each of our elementary buildings. Uh, we have intentionally kept them out of, for the most part, out of being the substitute teacher when, when we can't come up with subs. And they're gonna have to, they're, they're gonna have to uh, fill the gaps, to fill the holes. And, and then even, you know, as I talked in one of the meetings today, you know, to call me. You know, uh, you know, I, I'm got an engineering background and I love social studies. So pick me. And I, I think moving up to the physics and chemistry would be a, a challenge because that's been a while. But, but, right. but did somebody on our administration just volunteer to be a substitute? <laughs> I, b I believe the top echelon just volunteered. That's what I, 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 I know. I know that I, that I at one of our schools they were they were there were some issues with the teachers about it. And I and I said I'd do it. And as soon as I volunteered, those holes started filling up. So I, you know, I don't know. I, know I've I, heard a plan too with with um with some someone who had told me that had substituted before here said that uh, we hire our subs through an agency. Yes, and sir. The, the agency takes a, a pretty significant cut. That if we hired subs directly, that we may be able to sort of get uh, we'd have a better pool of subs. And more. Because, yeah, I guess. You know, say a substitute teacher gets a hundred dollars a day through the agency, and maybe we pay the agency a hundred and twenty dollars a day. I, I'm making up numbers. I have no idea what it is, but you know, we could then pay these substitutes directly the hundred and twenty dollars a day or whatever. So it would be more attractive to come here and work for us than it would to be going through agencies. Yeah. Substitutes are, are a, a probably a national shortage. They are a regional shortage. I know that. We talk about that. Um, we've talked about that a lot this summer in the, sub, in the superintendent's meeting, the county, where I think almost all of us are using the same agency. And in turn, substitutes want to stay the closest where they are or, and also where they, they have worked before and they feel very comfortable. Um, we have committed uh, subs to, that are there are, every day they know they're going to go into a building because routinely every day we have somebody that's that's um, a, one person, not the same person, but routinely we have an absence in every building. Um, it's going to be a tough year this way. And I, I would rather, um, to getting back to, to uh, Keith's question, is to, to ha have a, a more robust answer about what, what our expectations are, what, what our past has been, during a normal year for substitutes and, and then have a better answer for you at the first or the second meeting in August. Yeah, I think Keith was just suggesting, hey, what if we hire five extra people to sit on the bench? Yeah. That was, that was, Are we talking teachers or aides? Well, I, I, I'm saying, I'm saying, look, while we know, I mean, what I'm hearing is, and I, I'm thinking from, I, I, you know, dealing with personnel issues as well, you know, Story. Yes, sir. We know that. <laughs> you know, I just think about like, how can you, at a board, we can do, we can help you guys out by bolstering, you know, like John said, a bench for you. Um, it would, it would, you know, we would have to modify our budget or, or, or approve some additional spending. Um, but I was just trying to think of ways uh, as we sort of go down this path that to make it easier for not only the administration, but, but at the end of the day, the, the teachers in the classroom, if we have, if we give them something to sort of assist them, you know, and if there's nothing for this person to do, then we inject them into a class and maybe relieve some, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of ideas hey, that we would help. As, as, the finance, as the finance chair, you're more than well aware of our $6 million hole. And, and, and uh, this is extraordinary times. And that's why you have a, a reserve, reserve and a fund balance to plug those holes in those extreme circumstances. But we have to be, you know, we're still six weeks, seven weeks away from starting school. And so, and there could be a lot of things that change. One of the things if we're, you know, that's constantly on our, our mind is if we're directed by the governor to go virtual. And we have a lot of aides, aid positions and secretary positions right now that we're advertising for, but I've still kept a freeze on there because I'm think I, I'm hedging my bets because if we hire them, 
then we'll be paying them and they won't be in school. And they probably, a lot of them, you know, won't have a job. And so I'm, I'm playing that out. And, and it's really important for everyone who's in the, in the listening audience, especially those parents, is to please apply to be a, a substitute teacher. Put your application in, email me if you want the information. Since most folks know what my email address is, WRNR QCSD, we'll get the information out. But we, we're working behind the scenes. Now that we know, for the most part, 78% was the number that I had on registration uh, already. Once we get that, that number, the principals to figure out what's in class, we'll know that. Then the next step is figuring out what, how, are the teachers, how are our teachers actually going to respond? How many are uncomfortable with what the plan is? You know, I'm feeling very good in, so far about what our teachers are thinking about your acceptance of our plan, uh, our task force plan, our, our community's plan for opening up uh, schools. We want to get back there. They want to get back there, uh, but they want to feel safe. So if we can keep our numbers low from retirements, we've had four in the last week, um, had another one today. We had three last Monday and then um, and then one, uh, one today. Um, we, we're managing all that, um, and we're also trying to keep the, the eye on the bottom line because that that number uh, that if we hire more teachers, we hire a bench of teachers, we'll have to keep them in the system, and and we're down a hundred students. This is the first year we're on. Um, our total number is uh, four thousand nine hundred and eighty-seven students that we need to register. Last year we were at fifty. Right, right under 5,100 at 4,098 or something like that. We're still going down, and that's about four or five teachers a year. So, um, more babies. Well, I, I, I firm, well, there's a lot of construction going on, and I'm praying that we're going to get, we'll, we'll get a lot go of ahead, students. John, to, busy. Sir? Say, go ahead, John, get busy making those babies. Hey, we, Dr. We, Hunter, we, we I had asked you earlier. <laughs> I'd asked you earlier today then, um, I, I don't believe we had a nurse for each building before. Is that something we may, we should probably be looking oh, at now? We have, we have a nurse. Janet, you're on the call. You want to talk about, it? she just gave me a report on nurses. We just had her, the, the, our head nurse, and she's on the call. Mar Marge, are you on the call? She Marge? may not be able, she may be a uh, participant. Margie Regan. Yeah, I don't know if she's a participant. And Mar 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 she's on the call, but she's not a panelist. Okay. Well, first off, I'd like to publicly thank Marge for all of her uh, selfless service to to the, our students and our community for decades. She's going to retire, and um, but she was our lead nurse for our and a medical advisor for our task force. But she's out there, and so we have to do a hiring there. Um, but uh, tell the board, Janet, please, about how many nurses we have and how you have them assigned. Sure. So um, we do have a certified four certified school nurses that oversee our health room assistants in buildings where um, we don't have a certified school nurse, and all of those uh, health room assistants are all RNs. We have um, three certified nurses at the high school and the, including the academy. There are two at Strayer. There is one at the sixth grade center, um, Tehickon Valley, um, and Richland, and QE. And we also have um, two at, uh, at POF. Okay, so there's at least someone in every building that if a kid yes, comes, that's, that's what I was worried about. Yes, yeah. Okay. There, there are, and then our certified school nurses also oversee all of our private schools as well. And that's one thing that um, we're very cognizant of. If a private school is in our system, we have like St. Isidore's, and I know uh, Robin Conboy, Dr. Conboy is on this call, um, but uh, we provide a, a nursing assistance there and Faith Christian since it's moved in um, into our neighborhood, uh, we have to provide that assistance too. Correct, Janet? That assistance would be do, um, overseeing um, immunizations and making sure that all of the uh, height, weight, and vision checks are done, um, but we do not go in there every day to provide medication or anything like that. We, we follow what PDE requires us to follow. 
Does that answer your question, Chris? Hey, Dr. Harner, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, for some, some folks in the community have reached out to me, I guess they're listening in real time. So is, is a bachelor's degree to be a sub, is it, is it associates, bachelor's degree? Do you, what, how's that work for, for people? Barb, Barb Phillips, you're on the call. Please, I'll let her give the the very set answers. That, and, and, if she's and not Nancy, a panelist, can we unmute her? I don't know. Or Nancy, Nancy former HR director, Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards. Sorry, my buttons. Yeah, I, I am not the best person to ask because I haven't been responsible for HR for Seven six years. years. Five, six years now, and so I would not want to give old information that is not up to date. There's Barb on the bottom. <laughs> she just came on. She just came on. Hi, yes, I'm here. So, <laughs> so yes, all that's required. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. All that's required is a bachelor's degree. Bachelor's degree only. Um, and then they would file, they would still be hired through ESS, um, but that's all that's required. Um, they, those with a bachelor's degree, then they would also, uh, go through, there is a new, uh, teacher training that's done through the IU in coordination with ESS. Um, so it's like a two or three day training on you know the classroom management skills and things such as that once they're completed that um the iu will issue the emergency certifications for the these individuals and um the agreement is normally emergency certifications are only issued to individual school districts but um the iu and ess have an agreement that um the emergency certifications are good in all of Bucks County to, to well, emergency sub. Well, uh, Keith, we'll send out a note in the next week out to all of all users, to parents and um, to parents and, uh, and and let them know what our needs are and with all the requirements and points of contact. Because that, that's definitely part, one of our strategies that we have to have here. And every district has to have that because of the, the shortage of the shortage of subs. Thanks, so, Barb. So it's so it's it's people you have to have a bachelor's in hand. It's not people who are pursuing a bachelor's degree. That that is Barb, I I I just yeah. I just moved her moved her back, so I apologize. I thought the question was over. All right, that's fine. We can talk about it later. Not a big deal. I'll I'll send it out, sir. Or Barb will send it out. All right, any other questions? We can get maybe moving on with the rest of the agenda. All right. Thank everybody for your patience. So um, next item that is on the agenda, just give me a moment here. We have some items that are for board action, approval of, of the opening of Nighting Elementary for the 2021 school year. And there is a PDE resolution. Do I need to read that resolution? You're going to need to vote on A and B and items separately, and item C is an information only item. So I have to vote on, we have to do a vote on each of those separately, you said? On A and B. Okay. C is just information, but you need a, a separate okay. vote for A and a separate vote for B. All right, so then let's start with the approval of the opening of Nighting Elementary for the 2021 uh, school year, 2020-2021. So I'll need a motion to approve the opening. So moved. I'll second. Discussion. Who was the second? I'm sorry, I didn't catch. That was Chris. Chris, thank you. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna vote on the PDE resolution as presented. I'll need a motion for that. So moved, John. I'll second, Chris. Discussion. And this is just to 
purchase the the PD, right? right. No, no, this this no, is this is that weird oh. PDE. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Yes, so, my only beef with it is I don't want to give emergency declarations for four years. As long as there's a clause that says re reconsider every year. Dr. Harner? Any idea about that? I'm going to defer to Mr. Garden because he helped us with this. Jeff, are you there? Um, the, if you notice, it says the lesser of the emergency or four years. If you can, you can choose when the pandemic's over to set this resolution aside. That's, that's just a statutory language that PDE suggested. Okay, does that answer your question, John? So with, yeah. with this emergency declaration, it, it gives, you know, essentially Dr. Harner, if, if an emerge, you know, if, if a ruling comes from Harrisburg, it gives him the, the power to close the school without having to have a board meeting and get approval, correct? But also, it also deals with providing alternative options on your teaching as well. That's the primary purpose of the resolution because the school code wouldn't recognize virtual or hybrid. This gives you the opportunity to do those other methodologies as far as providing education under 510.1. So and it provides a lot of authority to districts you don't normally have during an emergency. Would oh, that include the live streaming question as well? Live streaming is just a methodology of providing virtual or hybrid teaching. Okay. But one of the one of the advantages also in the association is Ryan has said he's good with it um, is for snow days. We can if we have a, this past year, I don't think I uh, made a single phone call at, at five in the morning to anybody for snow day. Um, well, I would be against any resolution that gets rid of snow days. No, what the what the resolution well what it does is allows us to go virtual for that day. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> it allows us to ruin kids snow days. <laughs> Come on, man, you got to go out and make a snow. Well, you can still do that. Just put a little mannequin up that looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> Just freeze frame your your Zoom anyway. Two hundred and fifty. Okay, if, if, if the youngest kid in the house, just keep clicking. <laughs> if, that's if too funny else, if nobody else is concerned about the the, the length of time it, it just seemed odd capricious and long like your emails we can probably cheat <laughs> oh wow that was oh, messy. good point <laughs> oh, that was a slam <laughs> boom I he knows I got. I won't, I won't back off. I can't deny that. I I got nothing but love for his emails. I'm just giving him a hard time. Got to got to break up the monotony a little bit. That's right. Okay, I'm I'm satisfied. Okay. All right. So then, all those in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The last item is just an information item. This is the first reading of the live stream video on school district property. So I recommend you go ahead and read through that when you have some time. I, I did have some questions about this though. I thought we were sort of moving away from this. Wasn't there legal concerns about this, Jeff or Dr. Harner? Well, there's some consent required that may be necessary, but and we'll come to that. But because theoretically, if you are a student sitting in class and someone is you're not going to be you're not going to be on a screen because you're not going to be pointing to kids in the class but your voice theoretically could be streamed out to your hybrid colleagues in the class and someone can overhear it so we're going to be working on some consent forms on that issue like what colleges do all day yes. long yes yeah it's not like there's not blazing any trails and teachers would have to sign these consents as well. No, because they're 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 employees. It's not they're not minors whose educational records might because a a kid's comment in class theoretically, if it's recorded, could be an educational record. Teachers don't have educational records. So can I ask how the teachers are on board with this? Have they 
have they said yes about the idea of live streaming and all that? I don't have the answer, but you have to speak to the administration. I will tell you that uh, Mr. Williams, I'm sure he's on the call. He has to share with me personally some of his concerns about live streaming. Doesn't want it mandated. Um, and that's out there for that. This gets the ball rolling for the conversation um, so we can have it approved at the next meeting. But but I, uh, Ryan has shared that there is some concern from the association with mandating live streaming and can I ask, go ahead sorry, sir can I, can I ask what the concerns were i'm assuming privacy well, as well it is it was mostly i believe about what they um their practice their personal practice some teachers would not like it i uh, like to do it and some teachers are awesome at it we used to have a, a cyber program and of our own and our teachers are very good at it uh we're very good at it are very good at it and but they just don't want it mandated and so that's where the concern was from the association. Did and we I, ever purchase those cameras? I know we had a discussion about it, but I, I don't remember if we actually ever approved or purchased those. Um, Joe, would you um, answer answer that question? Yeah, sure. Sorry. I just had a piece of ice in my mouth. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I actually, because of it's coming out of a grant funding, I had to get three quotes, which I just finished up the last one today. Um, so we have three quotes and then uh, business office should be getting that uh, PO out and from my understanding they're in stock and should have a problem getting them in, in time for uh, probably late August. And, and where they can tape, tape um, um, their, their lesson by themselves and make it asynchronous. So it's not right. to the, the cameras not just for live streaming. They could be live stream if they want. Um, but uh, most can use those cameras to tape tape a less and then put it out there and then the, then the student and that's probably one of the biggest things that I'm I've received in emails from parents they want to there there's there's some who have said in this uh, in the, our May survey they wanted to have flexibility on when they their students would be participating in class and others would like to have it set here's first class second class third class so um, teachers will have the ability to create what they they prefer. So, so is there a the concern expectation that be that, uh, and I'm just trying to get to the idea of what the goal here is, uh, would the expectation from the administration be that the teachers are using it to flip their classroom uh, and provide flipped instruction like the, like what you're talking about? Or would it be that they would be using it to live stream as, as you said, mandate it? I'm not sure uh, it, what's, it, the, what's the end but, result look like. We're still in discussions with, with the, the association about uh, what's expected and what's not. Ryan and the association, they've been incredible partners this spring. And so I, 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 I wouldn't want to be held to using the word mandate is a, a really strong word that the association is not good with. And I'm not there yet with our discussions. We still have to work on it. Yeah, I, I think what I meant was what was like when you thought about this. What was the what was the uh, the picture? What did the picture look like for how they would use them for 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 cam purchasing the cameras? Yes. Sir. Oh, so the t every teacher has the flexibility to present a class, tape a class, do it uh, on their time schedule. Um, it, we know that there are going to be some teachers that won't be either that they will be out. They have they have sick days. They have vacation. They have days that they uh, uh, personal days. They're going to be out of the building, so they could have a class already set up to go. That's right in seesaw or right in right in um, Canvas, and the our substitutes can use that. So right now it's building flexibility, building out our technology. I know you can appreciate that since that's what you teach, and that's your that's, world. That's, that's kind of why I was asking. I, was I know there's no doubt in my mind that that's one of the reasons you had the question. But but is to build our, our program and and to give the teachers the resources um, so they can uh, uh, be all they can be for our practice. For well, it's one of their concerns that you're going to be sitting in your office with your fingers up in the uh, Montgomery Burns <laughs> position, monitoring their classes all day long with their cameras <laughs> on, or, or you know. Hopefully, hopefully, teachers know me well enough that I have a busy day. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love to see them. I love to be out there with the kids. Love to be in the classrooms. 
and all that kind of stuff, but that it, it's not that kind of oversight. There is some concern about that. That's a national problem right now, especially since the pandemic, um, about cameras and live streaming or, or even taping. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, something, but we want to, we have to, the purpose of this conversation is, and to move it forward, is to have a first reading of this policy and then, and then, um, then work fine tune it with our association. But there is no intention to use it for teacher evaluations or anything like that. Uh, no, right? sir. Okay. That's, no, that's kind of where legal? I was going with my weird way of saying no. it. No, 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 no. Would that even be legal? It wouldn't be consistent with your collective bargaining agreement to use that as a mechanism for an evaluation. All right, sounds like we got that pretty well cleared up. I'm, I appreciate the conversation around that because I know that's something that um, is pressing. And I believe Mr. Wien did a survey and 40, 49% of his membership are okay with it as an option, 385 don't believe in it, it should be used at all, and 4.7 say they're okay with it. So I think the idea is that we are providing additional flexibility for our teachers and trying to accommodate them in whatever way we can. Working with the, with Ryan work and our teachers have been amazing this spring, this summer, and, 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 and task force participation, even though it's summertime, um, very grateful. And, and I, I know the community is, and I know you are as a board, um, recognizing all that they're doing for us. Yeah, we definitely, we realize, teachers, that it we are asking a lot of you guys this this year, and, and it's certainly going to be a challenge, and I commit to you that we'll work with you guys through it. So along along that lines, I do. I mean, it, it, there are some good questions about the virtual component and and the other things. Is there? I mean, from a from a a. And again, I don't know if, if if family signed up. Do they sign consent? That, and you know, like I mean, in the hospital, we don't let people record what we're doing. Um, is there something that we I mean, we do to protect us as a district from that? Jeff, I'll let you handle the legal side of that. We had the obligation to maintain confidentiality with educational records. So we will be getting consents from parents to recognize that to some extent, certain elements of what might be an educational record can't be maintained in confidence because of the virtual component, the hybrid component. That's the purpose of the consent and release. Gotcha. Now, how about as far as restricting them from, you know, somebody recording it on their phone and then blasting it all over the internet? Well, you're not going to be able to do anything. That may happen anyway because of the nature of technology, but um, we will include prohibitions to that. But, you know, what do you do? How do you enforce it? How do you know until it's after the fact? Well, no, that's what I'm saying is if, if, if there's something we can do to, to just... Well, we will put the appropriate admonition in there about... Yeah. No transmission. All right. Sounds like. Thank you for the. Good. They're great questions. Yes, definitely very good questions. Okay, well, further ado, we're going to move on to our fiscal consent agenda. And we have on that agenda the approval of PPE, essential items for purchase, and the approval of the district tax, appe tax appeals for 2021. So I'll need a motion to vote on that. So moved. So moved. Somebody needs to second. I'll second, John. Discussion. Real quick one. Uh, just looking at the second, third, uh, or the first, second, and third lines on here where there's face shields uh, di district purchased. Um, isn't the county, are they only donating to the student and these would be for teachers then? They're donating. They, they're donating more than we have students and enough to cover staff and faculty, but it, it's a gift and we're not, it was not part of our plan because there's, they, they can't, it would be an incredible ticket for the county to pick up. So we're still buying, I mean, it only looks like 500 masks, so it, it's only $750. It didn't look like 
it's that big of a, a line item there. But then the, the next one down is the sanitizer stations with refills. Uh, didn't we purchase like multiple 55 gallon drums of hand sanitizer that we have, we have two. Oh. And we have two and we have shared um, with the local municipalities some of what we purchased back at the very beginning of this in March um, to the borough and other um, public service organizations if they didn't have it. And like 400 dispenser stations, if I recall. Yeah, it's $44,000 worth. Those are the only couple things. I mean, it's it's nice that you put the things that I was questioning all at the top of the list. Thanks for that. Yeah, hey, well, we're here to serve. <laughs> so the, this tax thing reminded me of the the recent uh, bill that that Wolf and every that came out of Harrisburg about. Um, and I don't know if somehow I think we already put our, our tax bills up, but wasn't there some sort of a way to relieve the pay the payment of taxes? Or was it the fees of the additional fees? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, I mean, it was the penalties, the fees. It, it was it was the allowing um, the uh, late paying of taxes. That's what it, that it, was. It theoretically, would have extended the time for payment at a discount and payment at the face amount. Didn't do anything else other than that. Thank you, Jeff. Is it is that something that we should bring up at a later point of conversation? Is that is that anything we can act on or? Oh, I'll, I'll put it on a topic as the, the finance committee. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean, if, you know, people are hurting out there, if there's any way we can extend, you know, cl us collecting our money, we've, we've got a larger. We, we had that discussion back in May, if you recall, or, or at least the finance committee did. Um, and we'll, we'll put it back on the agenda again. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. The human resources consent agenda is next and on that we have professional staff, supervisory technology staff, and support staff. So I'll need a motion to vote on those items. Ron Jackson makes the motion. I'll second. Discussion? My daughter was looking forward to have the same English teacher that her mother had this year, Mr. Mackey, who's retiring. So that's that's kind of a, a tough one for us, but you know, I guess it is his time. Well, Mr. Mackey, I've gotten to know him over the last seven years. He's a, a phenomenal English teacher, AP teacher, um, member of a team. We've got somebody out getting trained this summer. Um, even though he, he gave us, just gave us a re recent notice last Monday, um, not this week, um, last week. Um, Margie's there, um, Kim Kreider's there, and she's our ELL teacher, what a loss. And I think um, out of uh, Strayer just to, uh, this evening, and matter of fact, I got it about an hour before the meeting started, it was Miss McFetridge at Strayer. I just personally want to thank all the those that are the, the service to our district, those who are retiring. We really do appreciate your service and I hope you enjoy your retirement. Okay, let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Okay, that motion will carry unanimously and that leads us to our board comments, uh, new business. So the uh, funny article, not funny, but the one article that talked about the one Netherlands school opening with bubble machines. Is there any kind of fun thing that some of the buildings, especially with the, with the you know, smaller children, any, any kind of fun welcome back to school um, distraction device like, uh, like they use that allowed the children to sort of uh, have something to focus on other than, as Brian points out, things aren't like they used to be. Just a thought. Popcorn machine. <laughs> well, bubbles are better. You don't touch bubbles. They disappear. So 
Forget the fact. <laughs> For one of our eight schools, one is a brand new school. So that will be True. new. Good point. And I don't think Mr. Gutschel, well, after he's out there listening, that he plans on having bubbles. He'll probably have all kinds of neat things for the first day and grand opening and all that good stuff. I, every school does a great thing for their kids when they come back. Okay. It's, well, it's, this year especially will be helpful. But I, should we show them Lawrence Welk then? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> for those who are old enough to remember the bubble. Without, without the organ. Yeah. <laughs> no, we got to have the organ. That's true. Who doesn't like an organ? I always would gravitate to the any organ that friends of mine, you know, grandmother had or something. Yeah, who doesn't like playing those? Because especially when you can't play like me, but you can push buttons. Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> Caitlin, I think we should also mention um, the lifespan since we did have that little. Yes, you can mm -hmm. you can you share about that, Chris? I apologize, I almost did forget that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, on Monday after we had the tour with Dr. Damsker, we went over to the sixth grade center and Dr. Harner showed us around. And um, no, we, we had a really good tour of how Lifespan's been doing their summer camp and they went over how they did the, um, uh, how they've been basically have, they've had kids since March, since our school shut down. And they've had our kids, they've had zero new cases um, and they've eventually got around to getting the kids to wear masks successfully. And it really looked like a good program. And, and we did ask them, you know, since our days are going to be shorter, that um, we're going to probably be sending them more kids for before and after school care for even longer periods of time. And they had mentioned to us that they're ready for us and they're willing to work with the district. And uh, they work in our buildings and at the uh, LifeQuest building uh, across from the district offices. So I think Dr. Harner may have some more to share there, too. I, I received from the Cole Fetterman who gave you the tour. So I had, he texted her right before to get her to come join us and give you the information to, to the three of you, to David and you and uh, Kaylin. But she sent me the, uh, the financials of, uh, and the cost for this year. So I'll get them out to our community. Um, our, our relationship with Lifespan has been rather robust in, in years past it was before and after school we also have a business education partner with partnership with them um, where we have a pre-k program um, at, at Poff elementary school that they they run and we support it and we fund it um, through a state grant no less so it's not zero cost to the, the district and we also have a program at um, Richland elementary school and a, a interesting point of order for the audience also is that starting and uh, here in the fall we'll have a, a head start program which is similar to a pre-k pro program it's a fun federally funded program head start is where uh, uh, pre-k counts is a state funded program but that's going to be at night at elementary school and when i was out there this week i saw they were pouring footers for their the pre-k playground so it was Pretty cool, and um, and that's going to be available to uh, members of our community. Okay, great. Yes, thank you for that information. So there, so there's a lot of good questions in the Q and A. I don't know if somebody captures that, and maybe we could put that on a, maybe get some of the answers out there. I did copy it to a text file every time I every once in a while. I, I have the latest 68. I can email it to. You know, it might be just good for us to, to answer that, and uh, and so um, and I and I would commit to whoever asked the question, but I would absolutely feel 100% safe coming in and subbing. So um, if I have a free day, I'll I'll come in. I'll do it. By the way, I'm okay with coming back to regular meetings. I know that was asked. I, I would I would commit to that and, and help out and do my fair share. I actually was going to talk about that regular meetings thing next. I. As a huge fan of passive aggressive sarcasm, uh, I noticed one of the, the comments about us not meeting in person. And I, I just want to point out that it has been discussed and we are putting our money where our mouth is. And we do only want to do things if they're safe. And we did talk about coming back in person. Unfortunately, getting 300 people inside the district building to have this particular meeting is unreasonable um, in a live setting. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why we are meeting doing this virtually at this moment in time. We know these meetings are going to be so highly attended. You know, you, you can't do it face to face unless we're, you know, in the football stadium or something. 
I think we should, we should show everybody how tough we are and uh, do them in the unair conditioned QE classroom, spaced at four and a half feet. <laughs> I'm going to bring my own fan. Then. But no, on a serious <laughs> note, I, I thought we weren't allowed. That's why we were doing it this way until mid-August. When we were in yellow, we weren't allowed. But I think now that we're in green, I don't know. I'll wear a mask. I thought we were still, yeah. at, I we're still I, under the 25 we committed to have live meetings as long as you followed the appropriate social distancing and masks and so forth. I, do. I had suggested uh, having a meeting, uh, and I'm happy to do it in the QE classroom to kind of demonstrate that social distance, but then also zoom it out if that's, you know, if that's something. You know, I, I, I'm a visual learner, so I would learn that way. But even when we do go back to the boardroom, uh, I know we had talked a little bit about this before the meeting, but could we zoom out the the meeting or, or stream out the meeting in some way uh, live so that people can interact? And I know Joe had mentioned that before, but. Well, research it and see and let yeah, you all know what we can do. I, I will I will let you all know. Oh. I think this platform is great to reach the masses, of, especially mm -hmm. for people who are home with children and stuff. So it might be good to do a hybrid of that. That we speak about so something I will let you, oh I will let you know that the QE classrooms on Monday afternoon were 85 degrees inside too. The smoker. Ooh, I that's bet you. Have, uh, that's why we don't have school in the middle of July. Well, didn't they miss uh, about a week last year or year before because it was so hot over at QE? I don't recall. Uh, I know it's very hot. Um, I would doubt that we would not have school, but I know they have a lot of fans going on. But it was interesting that ventilation of the school is a concern by some of the, the faculty mm -hmm. members there. And I'm sure you, you, you were just talking about it, 85 degrees, all that kind of stuff. And I know it's not August yet, September when we start, but there is some, some concerns about um, ventilation. We have a report that we just put up on the website, I think today, about our uh, our other buildings and our and our, the evaluation that we, we had conducted to make sure this and it's attached to our FAQs on that uh, the uh, other schools. And Dr. Damsker, I, I think, did comment on that. Sorry, Dave, that we did have, and I I don't I'm not going to use the proper term. There's some kind of ventilation though in QE aside from just opening up those windows. Chris, do you remember that? Yeah, they Faith? do. They do have fans like these fan units in them, and he said that there is filters in them, and they are on a more rigorous or more frequent uh, change schedule than they normally would be. I believe it was like six months before. Now they're doing it quarterly. Uh, Rob, Rob's on this call. He would probably he answered that at the meeting on Monday. Rob? Yes, we, we do quarterly changes in all HVAC units. Which is more than you did last year, correct? No, we've been doing quarterly changes for a long time now. All right, thank you for that information. Any other, Dave, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? Any other new business? No, no, I'm good. We're good. Okay, so we have a public comment here that we wanted to save for the end. So um, I would ask Terry if you're going to be reading those. There's not a ton, like, I mean, there's, there's a lot, but could we attempt to try and um, any duplicates, maybe just try to capture and highlight those and let's do our best to get through these. Sure. Yeah, I, I tried to, um, highlight those that were we already talked about earlier. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we have one here from Diane Riccino from Richland Township. Um, as positive cases in PA as compared to most other states are relatively low right now, at what point if there is an increase in cases will schools be required to offer virtual classes only? Is there a threshold that you will use as criteria for your decision? <laughs> okay, uh, next public comment, Danielle Bensley uh, from Richland Township. Uh, thank you for allowing us to express our thoughts, opinions, and questions. I have very strong feelings about my children being in school with their peers and their teachers. 
without all the restrictions, hand sanitizing, constantly masked and, and distancing. Uh, these are our kids. Human interaction and keeping everything normal for them is the best thing we can do for our children who have been suffering in isolation for months. I have done my research and I believe the CDC recommendations are, are dangerous all around. Physical, emotionally, psych psychological, and mentally. We all have immune systems for a reason and kids need all those germs to build their bodies strong and be resistant to sickness as they get older. Um, okay. Um, next one is uh, Mary Bauer from Milford Township. Um, how safe are, cho are our children going back to school? Um, would you send your children to school? How concerned should we be about our kids being exposed to chemicals that the schools will be using to disinfect and clean? Um, Todd Hippoff from Richland Township. Um, the county is providing every student with a face shield, but from what I understand, not requiring a mask to be worn. The CDC says there are no studies to show that the shields by themselves contain the droplets. Would it be safer to recommend that masks be worn in conjunction with the shields? Would you please issue guidance to do so to keep not just the children safe, but the administration and the teachers? Um, Stephanie Cucinata. Um, hello, I'm a teacher within the district. I'm interested in your thoughts about requiring students to wear masks regardless if the three or six feet requirement is met in the classroom. Our classrooms are small areas, some with minimal ventilation. When a mask is removed and that student coughs, aren't viruses like COVID spread by the air? In addition, we have students not wearing masks in general due to exemptions. Shouldn't we require all other students to wear masks to protect themselves from those who are not wearing one in the classroom? In my opinion, masks aren't an option aren't optional in these situations during a pandemic. However, we could provide mask breaks to help our students from wearing them all day. Could we clean that up in our plan? It was a little, I, I think there's some confusion as to how our regular health and safety plan was coming back. And I believe even Dr. Damsker today was saying we should even wear masks beyond six feet when we're not having a dedicated mask break or eating. He said that masks should be worn at all times, except during mask breaks and when they're consuming food or yeah. drinking water. Kim, could we have our health and safety plan? Yeah, yeah, well, that? well it, it's, uh, we'll fix it on the FAQ. I think there's a, a glitch okay. there. And I think they came from a misunderstanding, uh, misunderstanding on our, uh, our part of something out there in, in our FAQ or um, not in the FAQ, but by administrator had made a comment and that's why there's some concern. We talked about it this afternoon to fix it. Is that a wrap? Okay, next um, public comment, Melissa Fox from Richland Township. Um, she has three items here. One, um, is the board considering, especially with a shortened day, eliminating specials and electives to minimize switching of classes and kids uh, passing in the hallway. Uh, two, will we stand on our own as a district when it comes to making decisions whether to open or close based on the local COVID numbers, facts and figures, and not just follow what neighboring school districts do? And three, um, what happened to bringing in all the special ed children with IEPs um, and letting them benefit from face-to-face -face teaching? In my opinion, that frees up virtual learning online, I'm sorry, virtual online teaching for the majority of the school district to be able to virtually move from class to class without the worry of violation of fate. Um, next one is from Mary Marrow from Richland Township. Um, since the doctor say that kids should be wearing masks if less than six feet apart, um, what is going to be done about students that request accommodations not to wear masks? Um, this is putting others at risk. Um, Melissa Fox, uh, Richland Township. Um, can special, um, special and elective teachers help out with subbing in other main subjects? Um, they are paid employees. Um, 
if, if their class is not going on, can they be helping out subbing in other classes? And that, that's pretty much the majority of the, of the public comment. Um, there are some things on here, but they were already covered with the um, conversation that um, Ms. Mitchell had earlier with everyone. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I think we did do our best here to try to, I tried my best and I, and I do apologize if there was a question that was asked that didn't get answered. Um, but I do think that we, we, you know, got through a good majority of those items. So thank you all for your patience on that. And um, <clears throat> before I, I go to our adjournment here, I, oh, Dave, did you raise your hand? Oh, sorry. Um, again, I just wanted to thank, thank everyone for their patience through this. You know, we are asking a lot from everyone. Thank you for, to the administration as well as, as our staff for being patient. I, I, I get daily texts from friends who want answers, you know, and, and please be patient with us as we're trying to work through. There's so many different situations that we're, we're providing details on and we hope to get that to you all as soon as possible. Okay, um, before we adjourn, I will be sending board members out a link for an executive session that I would like to have. And um, so you can look forward to that. Other than that, I would just need. Tonight. I'm sorry? Tonight? Yes, tonight, at, directly after this meeting. I would like to thank Dr. Damsker, too. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's so busy right now. The fact that he took the time to talk with us is really, I think, super important and, and we value his time. Thank you, guys. All right, so I'll just uh, need a motion to adjourn. I'll make it. And I shall second. Double second. Any discussion here? We're going to fight over who seconded for a little while. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, board members, look out for that separate link that I'm going to be sending you all. So I'll see you in a minute. And um, thank you to the public for joining us for this very important meeting. And please look forward to more information for our subsequent meetings. You need to do an all in favor. You need to vote to adjourn. The adjourn. Yes, yes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good night. I hope you guys have a great night. Bye, guys.